middle or at the uh, end? Maybe in the middle, I'll take five minutes br uh, break for questions. And ah. again, again at the end. Okay. Because I will also do a little bit of um, board work, white board work. So it will be a slide okay. plus. Uh, maybe in the middle, I will take five minutes br uh, break for questions. And again, ah. again at the end. Because I will also do a little bit of um, board work, white board work. Just for a minute, I'll. I'll... Is it going? Uh, one minute, one minute. That's it. Uh, it won't come. I'm hearing my sound. Yeah. <laughs> it won't come now. Okay. Yeah, sound inside sound inside sound. But anyway, last five days without any year. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any single issue. It's great so far. Krishna, yeah, Krishna yeah. you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks to all the students also. I think the enthusiasm has not uh, died down at all. Very nice. Yeah, I attended a few talks and the questions were amazing. Yeah, it's mm. so nice. So can you, I, I just check sharing the screen that you can yeah. see. Uh, is it visible or make, shall I make it full screen or? Full screen is better, it's yeah. visible. So you can still see the sidebar, no? Yeah. Now it's okay, no? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just for a minute, I'll share the schedule. Hmm. Today's last session is a, it's like a video tour of Kodai Kannal Observatory. Ewe will do it, yeah? Ewe will do it, yeah. yeah. So that people will feel like going there. Mm. Almost two years we haven't been anywhere. <laughs> yes. Okay, maybe you can show the titles slide along. <laughs> I'll just check uh, uh, my uh, is that called white uh, hole. Just point is not at nine twenty nine. I will make announcement and then Arachika will take over. Okay. Yeah. On so. This time. Uh, yeah, it's nine twenty. Ma'am, or should the recording be started? No, not yet. Okay. Just announcement need not be. Okay. Okay. I think there are about hundred participants already, so I will make the announcement now. Uh, so the first announcement is uh, yesterday's Zoom photo. It will be uploaded on the IIA. Uh, summer school page on the main page. So uh, I think it will be up by some time in a couple of hours. So you can download from there. That's the first. Please inform your other students who may have missed, may miss this announcement. The second announcement is uh, that today after 5 p.m. at 5 p.m. the Kodai Kanal tour will be over. Uh, after that, there will be, as announced earlier, there will be a 
uh, question and answer session with Professor Jayant Murthy. So those of you who are interested uh, can stay on and uh, those who are not interested can log out. So that will be the end of the of the school. Okay, Aratrika, it's over to you. You can take over now. Okay. So hello everyone. Welcome to the last day of this uh, summer school 2021. Today's, uh, today's session, uh, today's, the entire day would be focused on cosmology. The first session will be taken by Dr. Shubhina Dash. He's a faculty member here at IIA. So over to him. Hello. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah. Uh, I have also turned on the video. So, uh, Christopher, can you allow me the whiteboard option of Zoom? Because when I am uh, sharing, I have to in between, I do some board work. I think by default, it is allowed on me. It is allowed? But okay. till now, no one used it. Maybe you can check out. Okay. I was, I, I generally use it, but it is not coming up. Okay. Okay. Then I have to check the settings. Yeah, you just allow me because in the beginning, I don't need it. No, it is not so easy. I have to go inside. I'll check it. I'll try my best. Uh. Okay. Otherwise, I'll just stick to the. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, today's session, uh, I will be doing the GR part and the observational cosmology uh, will be done in the next lecture. Okay. So I know you have a lot of questions for cosmology, but hold on. Maybe some of them will be answered during the talk. Okay. So. okay, so let me go to the screen. Yeah, now you can check it. One minute, I'll save it. Okay, that will be great uh, if I can do it. Just then hold on, I'll just check it once. Uh, it has not yet come. Uh, no, no, it may be for me. I have to allow, maybe once again, I'll check it. But it's there, I made it down. Uh, Thank you, then. You can do it, then I need it after 10, 15 minutes. Uh, okay, then, oh, fine. Great. Okay, so you can see my screen and I am audible. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, cosmology and GR. Uh, first, I will do a little bit on the cosmology basic principle, then I will go to GR. But GR itself is a one semester course and cosmology itself is one semester. But I will try my best to give you the essence of cosmology and GR. So the first thing uh, about cosmology that it is the study of the universe from a very large scale. So you're studying universe as a whole. So in that way, the basic assumption of, of cosmology is universe is homogeneous and isotropic. And it looks same in all direction and definitely you are not the center of universe. But for our observation, the universe looks isotropic and we, it, everywhere we look, we we'll feel like that it, we are the center. But if there is another observer somewhere else in the universe, he or she will also feel that he is the center of the universe. So everywhere is the center here. There is no specific center. And this cosmological principle that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic breaks down in local observations, like say galaxy or solar system. So that's where uh, when you do cosmology, you have to think about the lens scale where you are looking. So for example, there are many lens scales we know from observation. Galaxies are around 10 kiloparsec, the diameter. But cosmology does not treat each galaxy as like a 
like a like an object of study individually because for cosmology all the galaxies galaxy clusters they all come together as a homogeneous fluid and so when we say we are doing cosmological observation generally we are in the megaparsec scale or more so intergalactic space is 100 kiloparsec whereas galaxy clusters are few megaparsec and the size of our uh, horizon of the universe which i'll talk a little bit later and there will be an also homework uh, tutorial on horizon horizon means that how much we can observe till now from the beginning of time till now that is our horizon because we are limited by the not by the technology only by by the physics laws of physics which is the velocity of light so as nothing can move faster than the speed of light so the distance light of light which was emitted we got some time of 14 billion years 13.7 billion years so there will be a finite distance we can it can travel uh, it cannot be infinity because we don't get we don't have infinite time in the universe so that is the age or you can think of a spherical cell from where the earliest light can reach us okay so that is the horizon of the universe and that is around 3000 megaparsec so you can see that when we go into the horizon in that big that this radius is 3000 megaparsec then even galaxy cluster looks like a dot here that Fargo cluster in the middle and then uh, I, I have given a tiny length scale here is 1 billion light year looks like half a centimeter here okay so you can see that universe is pretty big and each dot here is like a galaxy cluster there are billions of galaxy in it and each galaxy has you know that billions of stars so from this perspective universe is homogeneous and isotropic and the um, magic is once you apply einstein's general relativity that what you put inside the universe you know what i have inside the universe you can actually talk about you can derive you can calculate the 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 the, the fate of the universe the evolution of the universe how universe expanded what will happen to it what is the rate so this is amazing that if you tell that what you put in the universe Einstein's equations tells us that how it, 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 how it is dynamical and how you can solve for it. And that is one of the uh, essence of cosmology. It's called background cosmology. It means how the space in the background is uh, dynamical and is expanding because that will determine how the particle on it behaves. So that is called background, FRW background cosmology, which I'll talk about a little later. So now, uh, before I uh, go to the uh, cosmology, and I'll now take a turn now to the GR, because we need to move to GR, general relativity, uh, for, uh, Newton's law cannot do that to study the universe. So uh, I'll just tell here why Newton's cannot do that, and then I'll go back to the GR and do some board work. Okay, so Newton assumed that gravity is instantaneous. That means, suppose this moment or tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. sun disappear suddenly, it will not happen, but suppose some condition happens, sun disappear, then according to Newton, the Earth will fly off its orbit immediately because gravity is instantaneous. It's a force, which is, but that is wrong. We'll come to know that. Newton assumed the empty space is nothing and it does not interfere or participate into the game of or play of matter. That is what we solve no, in Newtonian dynamics, how the trajectory is moving. And these things. But that is also wrong because Einstein's somehow with his intuition came up with a theory where he says that empty space is not really nothing and it plays the most important role for the particle, how the particle will move, how the, how the, the, the dynamics of the stars or galaxy uh, will actually be determined by the uh, interference of the empty space. So this is completely absent in Newtonian's physics. And now we already know that the universe is expanding and it is expanding everywhere and in all directions. So it is the property of the space itself, not 
because of the peculiar velocity of the galaxies or individual object. One cannot get any expansion of space in Newton's formalism because in Newton's formalism, space is almost nothing and just a spectator. It's like gives you the stage of the drama where you go and watch theater. Nowadays, you don't watch theater. You can think of an IMAX movie screen. The movie screen does not interfere of the movie. So that was Newton's idea. But I would also believe that because that's the most natural idea. But Einstein is genius. So he came up with an amazing theory, which I'll be going next. But also much more, we'll know that in Einstein theory that gravity does not only depend on the mass of the two objects. So for example, you have two massive bodies at a distance M and M, it's a sun-like object. And their attraction is GMM, GMM by R squared in Newton. But now, according to Einstein, if I give you the same massive object, M and M, but their state of matter is such that one has pressure now, both of them has pressure, but the mass is same, you will have a different gravitational field. So it is not only the how much ma mass you have that we only, only know from new, uh, class 12 mechanics that only mass, if you if I give you, you know what is the force of gravity, but that is also not complete. If you, what is the state of the matter, whether matter has pressure inside or not, will also change the gravitational force. This is uh, absolutely very much important for cosmology and you will come to know that. And also, we know four or five year, four years back, the Nobel Prize has been given for gravity wave, waves of that empty space, nothingness, propagating into the space and we can observe it by uh, detector, gravity wave detector, and we have observed it uh, when two, two black hole merges one billion year back. And this gravity wave is completely absent in Newton's theory. So now, given all these things, we'll move to GR. And what is GR? For that, I need to first go to the little bit uh, idea of metric uh, in the, I'll do it quickly so that you know what is metric. Let me see if I get the, uh, I think uh, not getting the, have, have you given me the whiteboard option? No, no, I, I saved it, but I had to log out, uh, myself go out and come in, shall I do that experiment? <laughs> you can make me host and then yeah. you can log out, then it will not break okay. the... I'll do that. Yeah. In the meantime, I will uh, start uh, going in the direction, then uh, in, I'll again go back to the slide. Okay. And you can, if you, once you do that, give me a message. Yeah, and please uh, send me back. <laughs> Don't yeah, forget. yeah. I, I'll not okay. take the power up. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going on coming. Okay. I, the kind of software I have, it is compatible with Zoom. It is not the uh, uh, not the iPad I have. So let's see if it works. Works. Otherwise, I'll go with the. So uh, till now, let me go back to the slide. If I have not got the option yet. Yes. So. Let us start with uh, special relativity. But before that, the distance between two objects in space basically determines the geometry of the space. So now you know that if we are on the surface of Earth, uh, in a 2D surface which is curved, you cannot just use dx squared plus dy squared. Uh, then your geometry is changed, so uh, your metric is changed. A metric means the distance between two points. So Cartesian coordinate is just, you know that dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. But now, when you move from, the and this Cartesian coordinate is the basis of Newton's law. But special relativity incorporate time as also one of the dimension. And when you now talk about distance between two points, you cannot just talk about space distance. You have to talk about space-time distance because space itself can be contracted uh, uh, and time can be dilate, dilated, uh, it's not absolute. That the measurement of spatial distance depends on the velocity of the inertial frame. We all know it from special theory. So, but what is conjured now uh, is a new distance, which is minus c squared dt squared plus dx squared dy squared plus dt squared. 
So this distance is the new space-time distance. So, and the, it is called the distance between now to event because now time and space has to be specified. So T1, X1 and T2, X2, then the distance between these two events is dt minus dt square plus dx, dx square plus dy square plus dt square. Here, if you do inertial frame transformation with velocity and you know that you can, then you can show that this distance, newly defined distance is conserved. But if you just use the previous distance, it will not be conserved. So, and we know that, so in physics, we need a conserved quantity uh, and which is irrespective of the, the, the observer uh, frame. So that's why this is moving from Cartesian coordinate or you can say Newton's law, Newton's background space time to special relativity space time. It's called Minkowski space time. But now, if universe is expanding, then what will happen? What is the, this metric? So for that, uh, let me see whether I have the uh, option to slide my screen share. But still, uh, I don't have the option. Okay. You have given me? Maybe it starts with the settings what we defined in between. Although I changed, it's not taking, I don't know. Okay, then I will just move with the... Uh, someone was telling me I can use Google. Uh, I mean, you, you want to write or uh, you want yeah. to board? I, 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 have a, I, I have to write basically. I have a board. Uh, okay, board software. okay I'll, I'll try and share. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll just use, uh, I thought I'll be, because generally I'm able to do in all the Zoom I have. It's okay. So now if you don't have it, so then I will go with, uh, with some. I have to make it up with because I did not make slide here. I thought I'll do the board work. So let me uh, tell you that how we go from GR, uh, so Newton's law to GR. So the first thing here is, you know that if you have a coordinate and universe is expanding, then I'm drawing it the coordinate here. I'll show you. So suppose I have this, coordinate system. And I have two points here. You can choose the two point to be say uh, P1 and P2. And the distance between two points is by D, just dx square plus dy square plus dz square. Okay. Now if space expands, then what will happen? The coordinate grid will become bigger. Yes. Now the same two distance between two points, the points has not moved. Say you can think of two static object, but as the space has expanded, the distance will be changed now. So now if you just apply the dx square plus dy square dg square, then the coordinate has not changed because you will see that this point P1 will still have X1, Y1, Z1 coordinate and X2, Y2, Z2 coordinate because they are the mark on the your coordinate system, that does not change. So what change is the grid distance. So now you can- So can I check just uh, your chat box? Okay. Something is coming. Yeah, that is a board uh, you can try. Uh, provided you have to share screen that. Yes. So can you see? Oh, no, uh, I cannot. Can you see? Uh, I have to share this or you yeah. can? Yeah, no, no, you have to share. Okay. So I can otherwise, write. Yeah. Otherwise, I have to write chat box to all, everyone to watch that. Maybe you can share it so that YouTube people also can watch. Okay, but here you can see the screen now? No, you had to stop the current screen and... Uh... Okay, okay, great. So this is cool. But right now you didn't share any screen, I guess. No, I'm doing it. Okay. Please, uh, the recording hasn't been started. I ah, anyway, it is in the YouTube, thanks for... Okay, okay. So I am sharing what I should share, the Google screen. Yeah. 
so many options. Yeah, can you see uh, it? Now? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So now uh, the new d square will be you have to multiply with a factor a t square times d x square plus d y square plus d z square. I hope it is clear now because this a t tells you that originally you measured the distance between two particles at a time, say beginning of time, and then you are measuring the same distance, but universe has expanded. So now the particle coordinates are still same because this point is x1, y1, z1, and this is x2, y2, z2. They are the same, but as the space has expanded, you have to multiply with the factor AT. And this AT is called a uh, scale factor of the universe in expanding universe. So now your new metric, if you incorporate special relativity, so that will be this one. Okay. Now it is a little bit sophisticated on that because the space itself can have curvature, it can curve. Uh, so the new actual metric is in, it's called FRW metric, is this one, A square T. I'm going into the now spherical polar coordinate. So it's DR square by this new term comes one by K, one minus KR square. K is called the spatial curvature. It can be zero, it can be minus one, or it can be plus one. If it is zero, it's called flat space. It is minus one open and a plus close. And then you have your, as usual, uh, D uh, omega square, which is R square theta D theta square plus R square sine square theta D phi square. So now you know that this AT is taking care of the expansion of the universe. So now you see, forget about now the time part, AT is basically an increasing function. So the distance between two points will always increase if you measure later or later or later. So universe is expanding. So this is the new metric of the universe, which is beyond special relativity. And it is called FRW metric, Friedman, Watson, Robert, Robert, Walker metric, FRW metric. So now this will be very much useful. So the only unknown quantity in this metric, there are two, one is A, another is K. These are the unknown quantity. Because the d, dr, d theta, d phi, they are all just the coordinate distance. So now, when we want to know about the universe, that how universe is expanding, we need to basically solve a t. And general relativity will give you that solution that we will do it a little later. But before that, I have to explain general relativity in two slides. That what is general relativity? Okay. And very important thing here that you see, I have only taken a t as function of time because I have postulated, the cosmology postulate is that universe is homogeneous. That means this a t cannot be different at different point in space time. Then it will break the homogeneity. And also there is no theta involved here, theta or phi. That means the expansion does not depend on the direction. So that's why the homogeneity and isotropy is inbuilt in this distance measurement. Now, why I'm doing the distance measurement? Because it is the distance between two points which tells you how is your space curved or what is the geometry of the space, yes? Because for example, if you are in Cartesian coordinate, distance is dx square plus dy square plus dg square. But suppose you have a curved space on the surface of earth, you cannot use the same metric. You know that, that either your distance will be curved. The shortest way a plane can go uh, you cannot just penetrate the uh, earth and go to America from here. You have to go in a curved line. That is your shortest distance. So light will follow the shortest distance and that itself will be curved. Okay. So this is the idea of metric. Now let me go to GR. It's a really, a, uh, uh, really, I would say an adventure to tell GR in two slides. Okay. But hope you will get the essence. So to go into GIA, how Einstein's got the idea of general relativity is really fascinating. You have to go into elevator. Nowadays in Corona time, people does not want to go into the elevator, but it is an imaginable elevator, okay? So now suppose 
you are here in the elevator. This elevator is at rest. So now you are experiencing force of gravity. You are experiencing an acceleration G. Yes. Now, this elevator is actually uh, another elevator where you will be going soon. Where you are going to do, you are going to do a free fall. Then what happened? You will see that there is no gravity. So what you have done, actually you have gone from an inertial frame to an accelerated frame, where the frame itself is accelerating downward with, with G acceleration. And what it does, when you go into an inertial frame to a, uh, sorry, non-inertial frame or accelerated frame from inertial frame, it removes gravity. In the same way, suppose you are on space, in space, space station, there is no gravity, and then your lift in the space station start accelerating upward with the acceleration G. Then again, you will feel a force of gravity downward. So now you see, if you accelerating or non-inertial frame, you can source gravity, you can produce gravity. This Einstein first observed it. And then he postulated that maybe then the inner non-inertial frame or acceleration frame is something gravity is related to. And you know it now. You can produce gravity, acceleration G. Even if your space station suddenly you start going upward with a velocity or with an accelerated uh, inertial, non-inertial frame, you will get a uh, effect exactly like as if you are in earth gravity of G. So now, Einstein went one step ahead. And this is what I'm, I hope I can explain you. So let's plot the, plot the inertial frame. And uh, suppose it's only two dimension, okay? One time, one is one direction because lift is not curving in the space. And when it is inertial frame, lift is moving with uniform velocity, you'll always get a straight line. But when you are accelerating, non-accelerating frame, you'll get a curve, any curve, depending on what you are doing. So you see here, when you are producing gravity, you are actually curving space and time. So Einstein says gravity is nothing but curvature of space and time. I know my handwriting is not good, but still you will get an essence instead of going into the slide. So you see, when you are curving space and time, you are basically creating gravity. That's what I said in the elevator. So Einstein now postulate that gravity is nothing but curvature. Now let's move to three dimension. So now suppose we have a three dimensional space and this is sun. Einstein says, sun does not attract Earth instantaneously by some force. When sun comes here, Basically, the space become curved. It shows the space to be curved, and curved space means gravity. And Earth has to respond to that gravity. Same is true with the moon. So according to Einstein, and gravity is nothing but the geometry of space-time. And I'm moving fast. We can discuss later, because I have to cover quite a bit. OK? So I hope that you got an idea now from the lift elevator how you produce gravity or reduce gravity. From there, you go into the space-time diagram of an accelerated frame and you see it's curved. So whenever there is a curved space-time, you can produce gravity. But flat, you cannot. So that's the idea. And from there, I will go to a, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see that I have that movie. Yes. And that will be, end part of GR, then I'll go into the Friedman equation. Not end, the basic idea of the GR. And this movie uh, is made by my first PhD advisor. I had two advisors. So this one is, we'll start with Newton, okay? You can see the screen. 
Yes? Yes, sir. So let's see. So what Newton did is this. Before Einstein, the quest for unification began with the most famous accident in the history of science. As the story goes, one day in 1665, a young man was sitting under a tree when all of a sudden he saw an apple fall from above. And with the fall of that apple, Isaac Newton revolutionized our picture of the universe. In an audacious proposal for his time, Newton proclaimed that the force pulling apples to the ground and the force keeping the moon in orbit around the Earth were actually one and the same. In one fell swoop, Newton unified the heavens and the Earth. So this is actually the main essence of Newton's discovery, not just giving us that why apple is falling downward. He unified uh, the heaven and earth, means the laws of physics he said what is governing here in our mundane world is same so-called heaven. So heaven is right here. Okay. So that is beautiful because that unifies this terrestrial and celestial thing uh, in the first unification in the history of physics. And then you know that this Einstein also had a long dream of unifying all the forces. And till now, except gravity, all the three other forces has been unified and Nobel Prize has been given. But though, I, though Newton started with this idea of unification uh, gra with gravity, but still gravity has not been successful to unify with other things, but the effort is ongoing, that there is maybe only one force in the universe that splits into four forces called gravity, electromagnetism, strong force, and weak, inter weak forces. So now let's move. So, so I, Newton was genius, because he, 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 but still he was wrong, as I said. And what is what did Einstein did is that what I explained to you in the whiteboard, this will be now in the movie. In a single theory, he called gravity. The universe. After nearly 10 years of racking his brain, he found the answer in a new kind of unification. Einstein came to think of the three dimensions of space and the single dimension of time as bound together in a single fabric of space-time. It was his hope that by understanding the geometry of this four-dimensional fabric of space-time, that he could simply talk about things moving along surfaces in this space-time fabric. Like the surface of a trampoline, this unified fabric is warped and stretched by heavy objects like planets and stars. And it's this warping or curving of space-time that creates what we feel as gravity. A planet like the Earth is kept in orbit not because the sun reaches out and instantaneously grabs hold of it as Newton's theory, but simply because it follows curves in the spatial fabric caused by the sun's presence. So with this new understanding of gravity, let's rerun the cosmic catastrophe. So now let us run a catastrophe. Suppose as I was talking to you that Earth, say, sun disappeared tomorrow at 9, 10.04 10 a.m. It will not happen. But suppose it disappeared, according to Newton, immediately you will fly off. But now, as the space time is fabric like a uh, like like a like a like a waves so what happens that when sun disappear suddenly there will be a turbulence and that turbulence will create a wave on the space time fabric just like the wave happens when you throw a stone on the water and that wave einstein's exactly calculated today i don't have time for that it's called gravity wave wave of that empty space at the speed of light. There is exactly, you get a wave equation where one by C squared term, like you have wave equation in your uh, classical mechanics, uh, X term and D, uh, time term and one by V squared term. 
which is the velocity of the wave. Here you get the velocity is c, right? And that is the velocity of gravity wave. And let's see. Let's see what happens now if the sun disappears. The gravitational disturbance that results will form a wave that travels across the spatial fabric in much the same way that a pebble dropped into a pond makes ripples that travel across the surface of the water. So we wouldn't feel a change in our orbit around the sun until this wave reached the Earth. What's more, Einstein calculated that these ripples of gravity travel at exactly the speed of light. And so with this new approach, Einstein resolved the conflict with Newton over how fast gravity travels. And more than that, Einstein gave the world a new picture for what the force of gravity actually is. It's warps and curves in the fabric of space and time. Einstein called this new picture of gravity general relativity. And within a few short years, out. Within a few short years, he became the household name. And four years back, the gravity wave has been discovered again, telling Einstein was right. But the gravity wave we have discovered is not from sun, because the sun's presence or movement creates the gravity wave. It's so tiny because it's not easy to part of empty space because it's empty. By the way, it is not looking at the video, you can think of it like a fluid, but actually there is no such fluid, okay? Pure emptiness and how the wave comes, it's Einstein's genius. We all, I also don't have a feeling for it because how can you have a waves of emptiness? You can have waves of electromagnetic thing, but here the feeling is the distance between points changes because the metric changes. So if the wave passes by, as I was telling, the metric will change so suppose there are two points in Earth, when the wave passes by, it will just oscillate. And they have a laser interferometer in Louisiana, where you have exactly two big lengths, where the two path length of the light is zero. So you have a constructive in, uh, interference. Now, once the gravity wave passes by, not from sun, a billion light year back when two black hole merges, their space time was, its mass is so huge that it part of space time much more violently than sun but still it is very tiny we had to wait 20 years to build to go to that technology that uh, go to that sensitivity when black hole can the amount of gravity wave can be detected on earth because it can be even a little bit thermal noise can also make the two arm of the interferometer to shrink and go so you have to distinguish between gravity wave versus thermal noises and many other noises but we have done that scientists have done that and it's a nobel prize when it passes by one side, it's like a polarization of light, what Professor Sujan was telling. One side squeeze, another side is elongated. That's the nature of the gravity wave. So one length of the, one arm of the interferometer squeeze, another elongated. So there will be a path difference and that will create a disturbance in the fringe pattern. And they calculated back and you can say that how far is the, the black hole? When did the merger happen? And now many such event has been coming up, not only one black hole merger, so this is really fascinating that how Einstein uh, gave this idea of gravity wave, which is completely absent in Newton's mechanics. So now I'll move to cosmology because I need that. Now what do we have to do? We have to quantify this curvature term and we have to quantify how the mass or the energy change the curvature. And Einstein didn't know that when he discovered. He learned, first this idea came and then he went to mathematician learned the Riemannian geometry, and then he gave the Einstein's equations after a few years of general relativity. Okay, so let me go back now uh, to a little bit of board work again. So now cosmology, moving fast. Okay, 40 minutes I have already spent, but still okay, GR I have been able to do it. So cosmology is, you have to define that curvature and you have to equate it with the, what gives you the curvature, mass or density. So this term Einstein came up after doing a lot of mathematics, it's called G mu nu, 
is called Einstein tensor. It has this term R mu nu minus half G mu nu R is equal to eight pi G by C square T mu nu. I'll explain. These are, this is called Ricci scalar, can be calculated once you know the metric and this metric can be any metric of GR for cosmology, it is FRW. You can write this G mu in, in around black hole, that will be Schwarzschild metric. So depending on that, and this R mu nu can be calculated from FRW metric. So this whole right and left hand side is nothing but the function of the metric you give. So in our FRW case, metric has only two unknown. One is AT and K. So it will be function of AT and K. And right side, you have homogeneous universe and for homogeneous and isotropic fluid, uh, the stress energy tensor, this is called stress energy tensor, is nothing but uh, uh, quantification of the energy density you are putting in the space and that will basically carve your space time. And this is rho minus P minus P minus P. This you can, this is not your tutorial, but you can look into the Google that what, because it's not so hard that for an isotropic and homogeneous fluid, the, uh, this is a diagonal metric with this term and you can find out. Even in mechanic uh, no, uh, book, uh, it is there. It is not just only for GR. You can find out how the stress energy tensor behaves in a, for an isotropic and homogeneous fluid. So now, once I write down the equation, left side and right side, left side, I have two unknown, AT and K, and Einstein's equated with the right side, which I have rho and basically P. These are two unknown. So I get two Friedman equation, which are independent from cosmology. They are like this. By the way, uh, this derivative terms comes because the, because the, the uh, this G mu unit term contains all derivatives. Okay. So it's a, it's a higher order equation. So that's why you get time derivative, you might get space derivative, all these things. But for cosmology, it is very simple. A dot, it is basically dA by dt square. A is nothing but your scale factor is equal to eight pi g by three rho. And I'll just give you the exact number, uh, which is, I don't want to make a mistake. Yeah, rho minus k by s square. So now you see this a t, these are all a t. I am not writing it here, t, okay, maybe I can write it. So now this is first Friedman equation and the second Friedman equation, a dot by a, a which is the acceleration of the space, there is a minus term come and it becomes, uh, uh, okay. There is a minus term and there is a four pi g by three and you get rho plus three p term. So now you can see the pressure is entering into the space time curvature equation. That's what I was telling that it's not enough that if you put only rho, you have to also tell what is the state. So pressure and rho is parameterized by a quantity called equation of state W. I'll talk about it now very soon. So for example, so these are your two Friedman equation. Okay. Now you see unknown is A and you have to tell what you are putting rho and K and then P and then you solve for A. So now your tutorial homework show that from the first two Friedman equation, you get a Continuity equation, which is not an independent equation, but it's much easier to solve, is 3H. H is nothing but, I have to define, a, a dot, you know it already, A dot by A, uh, time derivative, or A dot by A is defined as H, Hubble parameter, you know that. Basically, velocity is proportional to expansion. So, A is kind of the length. So, v, A dot is velocity, and you know A dot is H times A, and it is exactly like V is H times D. So very similar. So now the equation you get 3h into rho plus p equals to zero. 
sorry i came down little bit but because to tell you but this is d rho by dt plus 3h rho plus p equals to 0 this equation is called continuity equation this you should be able to derive from the first two Friedman equation take derivative in the uh, in the of d rho dt term you get derivative here use the second equation and it is easy and our uh, uh, graduate student from ia Fajru will help you to get it so now let us solve something with this simple equation we can solve something amazing and we can talk about universe now so p is w times rho w is a parameter which I, is called equation of state equation of state parameter means at what state the matter is if the dot there are three states we know uh, which is important w equals to zero for matter or dark matter meaning the rest mass is so high that you can ignore the kinetic energy term so they are called non-relativistic matter and w equals to zero that means in cosmology term a particle which is heavy still it may have some high velocity but that velocity will be much much less compared to the rest mass and then you can say w equals to zero and that is true for matter and dark matter for photon we know that w equals to one third means pressure is equal to one third rho those who have done uh, msc course on statistical mechanics you have done it for boson gas and you can exactly calculate p equals to one third rho even for those who have done bsc or btec you know that for kinetic theory of gas you get this one third term okay uh, b squared so, so anyway this one third come appears so p equals to one third rho for uh, photon or massless neutrino neutrino which are very tiny mass okay so these are called radiation and now we will come to know very soon there is something called w equals to minus uh, sorry, w equals to uh, this i have to i don't know whether they have eraser here they should have uh, it's basically minus one okay w equals to minus one uh, minus one for cosmological constant or dark energy so how that i'll come to know so now let's go back to this equation second equation a double dot by a is minus rho plus 3p now there was a Nobel prize that you can actually measure not only the velocity a dot of space by looking at further object like supernova you can also measure how velocity is changing that means acceleration and we had an expectation all the people in cosmology that universes cannot accelerate I'll tell you why. Basically, these a double dot terms should be negative. For example, if you put p equals to zero for matter or radiation, these all positive term. You see, for these are all known particle we have. For any particle physics particle, rho plus three p term is always positive. These are always positive for normal. But what? astronomers discovered that a double dot is actually positive that means there is a negative sign that means rho plus 3p has to be negative and that means you have a negative pressure p has to be w or in other word w has to be less than minus one third now we don't have any particle or any idea in standard model of particle physics where a fluid where pressure can be negative but it is there and we know that from experiment they can also find that how much they have to be and that is almost 70 percent of the energy budget at the present time making the space accelerate and we call it dark energy because we don't know what it is only thing we know that it has pressure which is negative and we have no idea any such thing can have negative pressure one idea Einstein has had, Einstein is a genius, he has this idea called cosmological constant. But he gave this idea as one of his greatest blunder, in, he called it himself. So why? Because he 
saw the first friedman equation if you put any matter 4 pi sorry 8 pi g by 3 rho i am just writing k term is actually we will come to know that from observation this k is almost zero very close to zero so it's called flat universe it can be there but uh, theoretically but observationally we have seen it is zero so now for example you just take any row and you see that space is expanding a dot by a is positive that time hubble did not discover about expansion of the universe space positive so it was unknown to einstein that he was believing in a static universe and he wanted to stop the expansion of the universe but the equation was giving the expansion of the space so he added a term called lambda in the left side to stop the expansion only you have to add it left side to stop the expansion and he called it cosmological constant and for cosmological constant p is exactly minus rho that means w equals to minus 1 i'll not go into that why how you get it that uh, i'll just briefly touch today uh, but then the problem is now we know that space is act not only expanding actually it is accelerating so we have to bring we have to, the real equation nowadays is a dot by a square is equal to 8 by 3 rho plus lambda the right side so einstein made a mistake on the left making it on the left side but still we use his idea only p equals to minus rho just by changing the sign to explain the acceleration of the universe so now i am quickly coming to the continuity equation which i say it can be derived from the uh, first two friedman equation now let us use it for matter for matter, I have told P equals to zero. So if you put it here, P equals to zero, you get D rho by DT plus three H rho. So if I do little bit of mathematics, D rho by DT is equal to minus three DA by DT, H is DA by DT by A times rho. Now DT DT get canceled. So D rho by rho is minus three DA by A. You integrate it and you get rho goes at some constant by 1 by a cube. So now you know how when a pressureless fluid, how it, it redshifts or how it dilutes. It makes sense because it goes as 1 by volume. You can do the same thing for, this is not even tutorial question. You can do the same thing for uh, radiation. Uh, do the same thing. Repeat the same exercise, W equals to 1 third. And what you will get is rho radiation goes as rho naught, some radiation, by 1 by a to the power 4. Okay. And for cosmological constant, you know that d rho by dt is 3h rho plus p minus, but rho plus p is 0 for cosmological constant. So d rho dt is con uh, 0, so rho is constant. So even if the universe is expanding, uh, rho is not changing, volume changes. So then you ask, is energy conserved or not? We can discuss it. I have not given it as a problem, but energy is conserved. There is, even in this case also, how it goes even more than volume is diluting. Okay. So now with this, now we will have a plot of the different component of the universe because universe is either made up of matter or matter of radiation or matter of dark energy. Matter includes both dark matter and matter. Okay. So now if I plot in log scale, log rho i versus log of a, then uh, matter falls like a to the power minus 3. So it will be a slope, a to the power minus, it will be a straight line. And radiation goes even fast, faster, a to the power minus 4. This is radiation. This is matter. And dark energy, cosmological constant does not change, it's a constant. So we are here today. Today we are here. Okay. So now today we know that dark energy is dominating, it's 70%. Dark matter is around 26%. But if we go past, you will see there are three important phases happen. Now dark energy is dominating. 
but at some point matter was dominating see this is the matter which is falling and if you go even before then you see radiation was dominating so that's why we have three phase universe radiation dominated universe then this one is matter dominated universe and today is dark energy dominated universe this is the evolution of the universe and you get it from einstein's equation this happens up to uh, 1 million year universe is 14 billion year and this happens up to 7 billion years we don't know the exact number so 1 to 7 billions or 8 billion years and from the 8 billion years to today is dark energy domination now most of the galaxies structures where life has emerged you know the earth has come around 5 or 6 billion years here so it was already formed in matter dominated era so this is the form the matter only in matter dominated era galaxy can form okay so now why i quantitatively expand so to form galaxy you need to cluster matter so there are particles in the universe they have to come and form and have found bound object but there is a uh, tug of war between uh, uh, expansion of the universe versus gravity gravity wants to bring them together expansion wants to pull them apart also not only expansion the pressure pressure uh, repel gravity for coming so now i'll tell you for radiation dominated era pressure was so much that gravity loses gravity loses the game so generally the structure cannot form or even if form you cannot clump them together so that's why you cannot produce galaxy in radiation dominated era in dark energy dominated era today uh, for the last 6 billion years the gravity again loses because the expansion is so high that gravity uh, 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 again loses the game only in matter dominated era gravity wins and the galaxy was formed galaxy galaxy cluster everything and this whole thing we can even generate it in our supercomputer uh, given the einstein's equations this is fascinating we can produce even milky way andromeda to a good accuracy billions of galaxies can be produced starting from big bang but most of them were done in md the seed was done there so now uh, i am coming to a very important problem in cosmology uh, it called a uh, cosmological constant problem because i want to give you the where we stand so that the future bright youngsters you can take it over because i should not tell you that we have solved everything no there are many unknown things so now i am slowly moving into the unknown okay so now cosmological constant problem is we know that this plot we have already seen and today we have seen the dark energy dominance now one one candidate candidate for dark energy is lambda which i told it is nothing but actually very similar it is called vacuum energy energy of nothing so if it is energy of nothing then you can see that it does not change with the expansion of the universe the density energy density and this is very similar to the ground state energy of your simple harmonic oscillator but actually in uh, real life you don't have sim simple quantum mechanics you have quantum field theory where you can think of that our universe is made up of infinite such oscillator so there will be the zero point energy half h cross omega not uh, where it is not zero so you can sum it over there is a way to do that in field theory and you'll get the value of theoretical value of lambda lambda theory then people were so excited that wow the quantum field theory can give you the ground state energy is not zero and that energy is actually vacuum energy of einstein's cosmological constant and it is giving you the dark energy then what happens the observer also measured that what has to be the observed value because they know how much the universe is accelerating and that depends how much you put in the right side of the einstein's equation i have already told you with one equation and they find little mismatch and the mismatch is the in the history of physics the biggest mismatch between observation and theory 
the lambda observed has to be 10 to the power minus 120 times less than lambda theory. And this is called cosmological constant problem. Till now, there is no explanation why this number appears. Now, is it so important to have this number 10 to the power minus 120? Suppose anyway, it is chosen by hand from theory because you have to put it by ad hoc because you don't get it. So suppose, for example, I put it into instead of 10 to the power minus 120, I will put 10 to the power minus 170. Anyway, you erase three zeros out of 120 zero, what is a big deal? Because anyway, you are fine tuning it by hand. But then what will happen? The dark energy will move up because your, your energy is density is rising up. So then what will happen that the time when dark energy started dominating will be a little bit longer because you have you have taken over time from matter dominated era because dark energy value are increasing. So matter dominated era starts becoming squeezed because you, you have given matter dominated era around few billion years, seven, eight billion years. Now, this is a homework, what FASDU will do, that you can show, even if you erase three zeros, you can show that no galaxy can form. So this fine-tuned number is very important for you to even do the cosmology school, because if it is a little bit less, or a little bit high, then you are minus 117 or 116, you say that you will feel, that you will, uh, FASDU will show you that you cannot produce galaxy. So this is, called cosmological constant problem. And now uh, I want to uh, show you another uh, video uh, which will tell you that where we are moving with this cosmology. It's, it's string theories are trying, astronomers are trying, physicists are trying to get this number, uh, how we can have a, a cosmological constant value 10 to the power minus 120, but it's very hard, I tell you. Very, 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 very hard to get this number. So let's see whether it matters or not. Uh, how one idea is, I'm talking there now. Down. And this explanation represents great progress, but I promise you a mystery here in part one. Here it is. When the astronomers worked out how much of this dark energy must be infusing space to account for the cosmic speed up, Look at what they found. This number is small. Expressed in the relevant units, it is spectacularly small. And the mystery is to explain this peculiar number. We want this number to emerge from the laws of physics, but so far, no one has found a way to do that. Now, you might wonder, should you care? Maybe explaining this number is just a technical issue, a technical detail of interest to experts, but of no relevance to anybody else. Well, it surely is a technical detail, but some details really matter. Some details provide windows into uncharted realms of reality, and this peculiar number may be doing just that, as the only approach that so far made headway to explain it invokes the possibility of other universes, an idea that naturally emerges from string theory, which takes me to part two, string theory. So, so we'll not go there, but you need to have a multiverse idea of string theory to get uh, this small number. But now I want to show you the last two minutes video, the fate of the universe if dark energy is really cosmological constant, W equals to minus one. There has been many experiments going on to measure that W for dark energy, whether it is exactly minus one, or minus 0.99 or minus 1.02. That actually makes the fate of the universe a little different, but more or less, unless W is less than minus one, the fate of the universe is uh, this one in the video uh, that you will know that what will happen to our universe because of the expansion or accelerated expansion. Okay. Is not static, that space is spinning, that that expansion is speeding up and that there might be other universes all by carefully examining faint pinpoints of starlight coming to us from distant galaxies. But because the expansion is speeding up, in the very far future, those galaxies will rush away so far and so fast that we won't be able to see them, not because of technological limitations, but because of the laws of physics. The light those galaxies emit, even traveling at the fastest speed, the speed of light, 
will not be able to overcome the ever-widening gulf between us. So astronomers in the far future, looking out into deep space, will see nothing but an endless stretch of static, inky, black stillness. And they will conclude that the universe is static and unchanging and populated by a single central oasis of matter that they inhabit, a picture of the cosmos that we definitively know to be wrong. Now maybe those future astronomers will have records handed down from an earlier era like ours, attesting to an expanding cosmos teeming with galaxies, but would those future astronomers believe such ancient knowledge? Or would they believe in the black, static, empty universe that their own state-of-the-art observations reveal? I suspect the latter, which means that we are living through a remarkably privileged era when certain deep truths about the cosmos are still within reach of the human spirit of exploration. It appears that it may not always be that way. Because Okay, so that's the idea of dark energy. Now I move to the rest of the cosmology in 10 minutes. But I have given you the basic idea of GR, dark energy, different epochs of universe. And you see that uh, if dark energy dominates, then we know that after a few billion years, uh, even the light wants to come from nearby galaxy to us, it will not be because the space is moving very fast in between. And that is the idea of horizon fast and there is a pro problem, Fazlo will do that. Uh, that uh, light wants to travel to you, but space is going away. So there is a competition between light and space velocity. Who wins? Okay. So now let me go to the uh, uh, last few slides of the talk. Uh, I know that I, the dark, though I work on dark matter myself, but I will not be able to touch it today. Uh, it's impossible to do all these things. Uh, but uh, let me go quickly to the rest of the slides. So now you know all these things. I have already told you. Uh, you are now uh, quite uh, educated on this. Okay. So boardwalk. I have done all these things. Okay. From FRW equations, solutions, and Fazlu will do mostly how AT also goes as a function of time. And uh, that also you can easily show uh, that given the matter dominated area, how a scale factor expands as a function of time is very easy. Okay, so this is the pl plot I have already shown you. And this is the famous uh, plot in a picture. You see that in the beginning, there is radiation dominated era till the CMB, I will come to that now. Then the matter dominated era, and then finally last four or five billion years, you see the curve is moving up. That means the space is again started accelerating and it will go up and up and up. So now, one thing is from thermodynamics, you can prove that the temperature of the universe actually goes as one by T. This is simple homework like laws of thermodynamics, ds is equal to d of rho plus p plus v by t, and rho plus p by t times v is conserved because entropy is conserved. Now you can show that rho plus p is goes as t to the power four, those who have done uh, MSc physics or statmet, rho, or even you know Stefan's Boltzmann law is rho is equal to t to the power four. So t to the power four by t, so t cube times v, V is A cube is constant entropy. So T cubes time A cube is constant. So T is one by A. So now you see, though we started from a very hot Big Bang, universe cooling down because of the expansion. And at some point, universe will reach a point of 13.6 electron volt. Before that, hydrogen was ionized because your photon has more temperature, more energy than 13.6 electron volt. So every time an atom will be wanting to form electron coming into the first orbit of hydrogen, forming neutron hydrogen, but electron, uh, the photon will kick it out. So universe was ionized and opaque because the photon was interacting and doing random work. So light could not come to us. But after 13.6 electron volt, but in reality, it does not happen at 13.6 electron volt. It happens 0.1 electron volt. That also we can discuss. That depends on the the Maxwell's Boltzmann distribution, or sorry, Planck distribution of black body radiation. Because you have a high energy tail where there is still 13.6 is in the middle, but still you have a lot of photon in the high energy tail of the Planck distribution. Anyway, so this at point, point 0.1 electron volt, there will be a temperature, uh, there will be some, a time when hydrogen atom form and electron and uh, photons get released. 
and they don't interact and they sleep com coming to us from that time, that can be calculated. That happens at 0.3 million year, just at the around the matter radiation equality that time, little bit after. Okay, so that radiation has been observed and got Nobel Prize. It was released at a temperature of 3000 Kelvin. At that time, you can convert it electron volt to Kelvin. And then again, after it is released, universe is expanding no, for 14 billion years. So it will be again going as 1 by T, 1 by A. And you see that the today's temperature will be 2.725 Kelvin. And as it is coming from everywhere, you should see it everywhere. And there was two engineers, they are electrical engineers from Princeton. They wanted to measure something else. But they found this microwave, this belongs to the micro, falls in the microwave range. Microwave noise coming from every direction. And they then say like, it cannot be a star or localized object. Then they changed their experiment to another continent. They found the same. Then they claim that, wow, this might be the same fossil radiation cosmologists had talked about and they got Nobel Prize. So this is the earliest epoch from where we have seen around 0.3 million year after Big Bang. And today we are at 13.7 billion year. So 0.3 million year is nothing but like a baby universe compared to 13.7 billion years. And there has been, uh, you know, Prabhav here works on, Prabhav the madam works on that uh, in detail that you can get huge amount of information about universe, early universe, and how the photon travel from there to today through epoch of dark ages that, uh, and that then uh, we have these ages of intergalaxy formation that the next talk will be focusing on, that how universe evolved till after CMB till today and galaxy formation, everything happened. Now, I'll quickly tell how much time do I have or I have crossed? So I think eight minutes. Huh? Five to 10 minutes? Eight, eight minutes, I think. Eight, eight minutes. minutes, okay. Then I can have questions, no? If I have time. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, good. So now, problems with Big Bang cosmology. The problem is, first, the name is misleading. The name, says it big bang cosmology, but it does not tell how the bang happens at t equals to zero, and nor does it tell that what caused it. So this is still a mystery, because you can see at a t goes as that first will do it, t to the power half, I, I told you that you can solve from Friedman equation how a t goes as proportional to time. And at t equals to zero, you see a goes to zero, and once a goes to zero, your metric breaks down because matrix is multiplied by this factor 80. So that means space times completely break down. So you cannot do a physics there. So that's why it is unknown. But other than that, there is another big problem that universe is radiation dominated, hot Big Bang, that is called radiation dominated era. After Big Bang happened is a huge high temperature, then matter domination, then dark energy domination, which I have already discussed. But that itself is not complete. And that leads to another beautiful thing. And it is also related to the cosmic microwave background. I told you that cosmic microwave background is coming from every direction till today. And you will see it, that Planck satellite or WMAP satellite has measured it. It is like an IMAX theater, 2D IMAX theater in the sky. And the distance of radius is like that. Because that also will be exactly calculate, calculating how much distance is that in the tutorial? Now, <clears throat> there is a problem here. When CMB was released, I told you it is very, very baby universe. Okay, so you can see, you can take the circle in the right side and take the circle in the left side. Uh, so for example, I give you an idea that this circle is basically nothing but the size of the horizon at that time, means what? how much distance light could travel at the time of CMB. It's basically around 0.3 million year times the velocity of light. A Little bit more than that because the space is expanding. So more or less like that, 0.3 T naught. So which is I'm drawing in a circle and left side also I draw in a circle. So now you see the highest distance causal physics can happen by the laws of physics. It is bounded because light cannot travel more than speed of light, uh, speed C. So only this circle can interact with each other on the left side, this circle can interact with each other. And this belongs to around one degree 
of the CMB sky today. When we observe with uh, plan, this is it's scanning the whole sphere. So one degree is like if you take the angle in the after the angle, it will be like r times theta. Uh, d d r uh, d a times theta is r. Okay, so this one degree is could be in causal contact because that much time photon has got. But amazingly, the right side circle and the left side circle, or you can take other circles like that, they are all in same temperature. Now the question comes that you cannot even uh, go reach uh, more than this boundary, then how come this photon travel and interact with this side of the photon and equilibrate and get the same temperature? This problem is called horizon problem because they officially cannot uh, even interact, but they have somehow common information of same temperature of 2.3 Kelvin, but that time it was 3000 Kelvin. So now there are two choices. One, photons maybe violated the speed of light and they have gone much farther distance because see, from going from left circle to the right circle, the tiny circle, the time you need is huge, it's billion years, but that time it was only million years when CMB was released. So how can you get that time? So there is not enough time. So you have to violate the velocity of light, but that is not done. That is not possible. We have not seen any violation of special relativity. The another option is coming now. This. Maybe before CMB, at some point they were all together. And now at some point they expanded much, 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 but not they, the space, because the particle or photon cannot go much than the speed of light, but the space itself can go because special relativity does not prohibit space to expand faster than the speed of light. So they can go an exponential block and then you see CMB there in different part, but at past they were together. And this time is pretty small. The blow up is happening in scale factor is 10 to the power minus 60 to almost 10 to the power 60 time at the time period of 10 to the power minus 45 to 10 to the power minus 35 seconds. Can you imagine that in the beginning of time, this exponential expansion happens and we know how exponential expansion can be obtained uh, if you put another dark energy kind of fluid there. Then you can show that uh, you, your space will expand exponentially. So this, if it is true, then you solve this mystery called horizon problem. And then you have to add another epoch before radiation that is another similar to dark energy, but much, much higher speed. That is called cosmic inflation. And that time the length scale was exactly quantum mechanics. Very, very tiny. Time is 10 to the power minus 35 seconds. And that is great that it came from quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics has fluctuations. And that's why you see on CMB, there is fluctuations in density. And that is, we are very thankful to universe because there is fluctuation. Because if it is completely homogeneous, even if you apply all forces of gravity, you can never create galaxy because force will be balanced in every point and it will be nullified because it is completely homogeneous. So you cannot create a galaxy from a complete homogeneous. So luckily we came from quantum mechanics and inhomogeneity can be calculated exactly by Einstein's theory from inflation. Inflation not only solves horizon problem, but give you this, 10 to the, this tiny fluctuation of 10 to the power minus five. And that 10 to the power minus five order of fluctuation in matter dominated era mainly grow more and more. And at some point hit delta rho by rho is one and then hit more, it become nonlinear and collapse into galaxy and all these things form. So we have a quantum origin, but here I want to say one thing. If there would not be a very rapid expansion of 10 to the power minus 35 second order, universe didn't even take one second to go 10 to the power 60 times bigger in this inflation. And that is great because quantum mechanics had this inherent fluctuation. But if universe would evolve somehow slowly, then it will be smoothed out classically because you know that in classical mechanics, we don't see fluctuation. So nature didn't give space time to equilibrate. And that's why the quantum mechanics somehow become classical without following the normal Feynman's, uh, you know, Feynman lecture, Feynman showed that 
if you take the limit h cross to zero, you can show that the all fluctuation vanishes. But here it is different. Here you don't have that smooth limit because universe was very drastic, expanded 10 to the power 60 times in 10 to the minus 35 order second. So that's why quantum fluctuation didn't get time to smooth out and become zero. And so that we can, we are here. So now I want to finish uh, uh, this also I have told uh, that this will, we will discuss that this n body simulation, there is many videos and we do it in computer simulation. The starting from that 10 to the power minus five, how you produce galaxies. And I have already told that there is a competition between pressure and galaxy and expansion. And I have already told that also dark energy domination has to, uh, has to uh, be exactly in the same time for you to, uh, for galaxy to form, okay? And so this is all. So I want to finish with this that and Sujan, Professor Sujan Chakravarti told them the life itself is uh, is very is a very complex statical phenomena. And even within our three thousand light year away, we don't see any Earth-like objects sustaining life. But I told you here today, even to form Earth, it's not easy. You have to fine tune the cosmological constant and many other quantum processes has to go that I have not told. So again, my conclusion will be same as Sujan that we got life. First we got planets, we got the galaxies and we got life and let's preserve life and let's make the future generation happy. Okay, so thank you. Sir, uh, there are quite a uh, few number of questions. Now yeah, I know. 16, I think. Ah. So uh, how many would you like to take? You, you tell, the rest we can take a little bit in the... Uh, by the way, you can also contact me personally in my email address. From IA, you can take money. If the, your question is not answered, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So there is this question from YouTube. Kevin Chetri asks, "Why the universe looks the way it is? Why is it so big?" This uh, cannot be answered because that is what it is. Physics is not to. We have not yet reached that state that will tell how universe is so big. But one thing I told you that inflation happens so fast that in 10 to the first, it becomes 10 to the first 60 times. So that we know that it has to be big. But why it looks the way it is that, because that's what we have and our idea is to solve it and demystify it and also to explore it, yeah. Then uh, Kritika S is asking, why in new metric we introduce negative sign? Uh, she is talking about the minus is square is so without negative sign, that is you should study the special relativity. You cannot have, uh, d square conserve because you need to have a distance which does not change with inertial frame. So you need to put that minus uh, c square. It is the basic of special relativity in BSC physics or any BTEC physics. You can read that and without negative sign, you cannot uh, have a conserve metric which does not, because the distance should not change. Suppose I have this pen and ultimately pen distance is same. So there should be something to define that what is the actual distance. You know? So that will come from the metric. <clears throat> yeah. There's this question from YouTube. Rida Narula asks, since universe is expanding spatially, is there any chance that something is happening to time as well? So do we need a scale factor for time? For the time to expand, no, it is, we don't say that space is expanding. We say that it is a complicated together space and time. We don't separate space because, uh, because of the time only space is expanding. It is but in front of time, we don't need another factor of space dependence because then it will violate the inner the homogeneous universe. In front of space part, we have multiplied with the time part. That's okay. But if you multiply something with the time part with the space part, that will violate the homogeneity. But that means you are putting your expansion or metric depending on the different part. But universe looks same everywhere. Yeah, next. Sneha asks. Is there any chance in recollapse of the universe? If yes, on what basis we can justify that? Yeah, it, there has been a model, but that has a lot of problems, but there has been a model that where universe expand, 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 and then stop. But with the present idea of dark energy, it is not like that. I have told you the fate of the universe, it will be empty, it will not collapse. But who knows, maybe our understanding, because what will happen in 14 billion, 10, 15 billion years later, maybe there will be a phase transition in the dark energy. Who knows? It may happen. Aditya asks, why is it A square? What is its value? 
Okay. So A is, uh, you cannot absolutely determine A. A is one today normalized to one. Uh, that is another homework. Uh, I could not do it today, uh, the, but hopefully we will do it. That you can map A with the red shift. One by A is equal to one plus Z. Z is the red shift. So A is nothing but a scale factor which can be taken as a time uh, time parameter also because bigger is means later. So you can say that oh I have this scale factor that means it is in this time. Uh, Gopal Chetty asks, sir, till what extent does GR apply to the farthest, smallest, and largest scales? GR applies to the biggest scale. In quantum mechanics, till now, we don't have a theory of GR and quantum mechanics together. String theory is an approach to it, but still it is not confirmed that whether string theory is the right theory of the universe or not. But GR works with the large distance and with high massive body. Arya is asking, space time is curved, but how is it assumed that the horizon of the universe is perfectly spherical? Horizon of the universe can be curved depending if you if you have a metric, but with the FRW metric, it is assumed spherical because of the isotropy. If it is not spherical, somewhere distortion here, there, then you break the cosmological principle of isotropy that it is not the same. For isotropy, it has to be the same. Yes. Yes. Uh, there's another question from YouTube. Uh, uh, I have heard that in the FRW metric, k can be zero, plus one or minus one. If k is zero, then the curvature of space is flat. How this flat face is defined in the fourth dimension, what flat signifies? So this flatness is not the space-time flatness. See, you can calculate the curvature of space and time together. That is called because time is like a dimension. So that curvature is non-zero for GR. FRW metric, if you calculate, and that's why you get the left-hand side of Einstein's equation, because it's all dependent on the R mu is curvature. If curvature is zero, you get all zero term in the left-hand side. But space part itself can twist between itself. Who knows, it could be, but uh, because the three space dimension could twist between each, and, and we can see them from a fourth dimension, you are right. So there is an extra fourth dimension of space, you will see that it's curved. Uh, but we don't have that uh, from observation. We know that if it is have a, have an intrinsic curvature k equals to one or minus one, it will change the Friedman equation k by a squared term. That will change the history of the universe and that will change the CMB. So we know that uh, that is not allowed. K equals to almost zero. In fact, I have not touched one problem. Inflation makes k equals to zero. That's why inflation solves that also. Explain that. Yeah, it's called flatness problem. Yeah, next. Sir, I think the next session has to start from 11 yeah. 20. Yeah. So, and this session was supposed to end at 10 50. So, I think it would be better if the students who still have questions write to you directly. Yeah. And in discussion session, I will be also there. If we are done with the problem session, we can take some questions. Okay. Simna, uh, it, it, is there anything to share that the whiteboard notes? Uh, oh, no. Can I share? Is it? Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think we can end the session now. Let's meet again at 11.20 for the next talk.
Krish, you there? Uh, Chris is there. Hello. I think health is Ravi. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just so we are asking him to. Voice is clear? Yes, sir, it is audible. Okay, thank you so much. So, has Ravi joined? Yes, ma'am. He has joined. Uh, okay, maybe. Yes, I'm here. It's check the slides and all that yeah, sure. that will be great so maybe uh, can i share are you yeah are please you wait co -host? okay no no i'm not yet okay crispin has to do that i think crispin is not around maybe I'll just call him. Sorry, I got disconnected for a while. Chris, can you please make me co-host again? Yeah, Ratrika, I'm calling Crispin to do that. Okay. Okay, Ravi, you are a co-host now. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so I'll share the screen. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, it's visible. Maybe you can make it full screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing it. Done. Uh, can you see the full screen? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, maybe in the beginning, uh, you could turn your video on so that people can see your face for some time. Oh, when you start okay. the picture, then you sure, can sure. turn. So Aratrika is going sure. to be the chair sure. of your session. Yeah. Okay. So do you also have a, like a blackboard option? Uh, no, I think basically I'll mostly cover. Uh, I think I like enabled it. it. It is possible now. Okay. Okay, fine. I thought if you do, we could test it in the beginning itself. So I have switched on the video, but it's, it shows a cross to me. Uh, I don't know oh. why. Uh, I don't see any video, even though you are speaking. Okay, it shows like cross on my uh, the, the panel. Where... Oh, Crispin, can you please check it? No, oh, far as it shows, uh, it's open. Maybe oh, I'll. I don't see anything. Why am I not seeing? As per our property, it is open. This video. Maybe I'll once again ask you to start. Okay, I'll start. Okay, okay. 
Yeah, some software protection, I don't know. Maybe I can uh, quit and join again. Uh, time. Yeah, I think there is time. You can do that. Okay. I don't know. Not working. You are using laptop, right? Yes, I'm using laptop. Okay. Yes, I'm using laptop. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Hello, Christine. So, uh, okay, thank you. Anshika says you your camera is off. My it shows that your camera is off. Camera Wait, is no, if it is integrated oh, uh, camera, then it should work. When you are... Yeah, it should. It, it basically works every time. I don't know why it's not working now. Uh, this is surprising. I'm seeing it for the first time. So in the start video option, there is a triangle. You can check if the source is correct. <laughs> Actually, even I don't know what you look like, Ravi. Oh, isn't there? <laughs> okay. I have not met you. To... Okay, maybe just... I'll just join again then. If it doesn't work, it's all right. Yeah. Not, not very important. Okay. Oh, it's unfortunate. Anyways. So, Aratika, you are sharing, yes. right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay. So, shall we start now? It's 11.20. Yeah. Yeah, so That's more sure. than 100 students have joined already. So, uh, this next uh, next session today would be would be taken by uh, Dr. Ravi Joshi. He is a faculty member here at IIA. So, over to him. Okay, thank you, Aratika. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Ravi here. So, in the last hello, is the sound off? Yeah, I think he's not audible. I'll just uh, try to say something about the observation cost. So we will basically uh, start with mapping the cell. So we'll talk about cosmic microwave background, uh, Big Bang synthesis, and we'll also touch upon uh, dark matter and dark energy. And finally, uh, we will uh, talk about the cost, uh, the future aspects of cosmology. Okay. So here I put like a few uh, several but questions. Is, sorry, sorry. Is the screen visible? I don't know. No, no, it's not visible. No. Ravi, you can share the screen once again. And, uh... Uh, from past uh, several centuries, if there are stars or planets, and even the space are Milky Way, or they are different. And even like uh, we didn't know, like uh, if there are other objects other than the stars and the galaxies. Okay. And the big question is that the what is uh, how how do we? Uh, your screen is not visible. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. There is, we are not seeing your screen. The screen is not visible. You cannot uh, see the screen. Share it. Go to the share option. Can you see it now? Yeah, fine. Yeah, fine. Now. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So basically, I was telling that uh, the big question was that what is the origin of the universe and what is its fate? So, do we understand it well? 
and uh, of course the pressing question is that is that is there is any civilization uh, out there uh, within our milky way or even like uh, in in other galaxies okay so if you really want to know that uh, what we have to do is that we have to uh, look the universe uh, out and this is just to show you that if you uh, basically uh, this figure if you look the uh, the sky uh, with the naked eye what you see is that you see all sorts of celestial objects there and uh, if you just like try to count them try to map the sky hardly you could uh, count roughly 3000 to 5000 stars okay and but astronomers told us that using the large telescopes that uh, basically these bunch of stars uh, clump together they form galaxies and there are like uh, billions of stars there and billions of galaxies in the universe so how do we know about that okay so it is one of the fundamental thing that we want to understand like what is the nature of these objects but uh, this is also important to know like how they are distributed okay what is their distance what is their to to what what is their uh, tomography and this kind of stuff so if you really, if you really want to understand this uh, what we have to do is that we have to find the distances and for that uh, we have to climb the cosmic distance ladder okay so let's try to do that so if you want to find the distance uh, so the, the basic thing to uh, 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 or like usually uh, the most common thing we uh, try to find the distance is basically called the triangulation technique or we call it stellar parallax also so this uh, we all have done like at some stage in our uh, uh, younger time that uh, if you if you see a very nearby, nearby objects with your one eye it appears somewhere at uh, some position and if you see it with the other eye there is a slight change in the angle okay uh, so basically if you this this angle if you know that angle and using a simple geometry you can calculate the distance to that object and this essentially work that uh, this essentially work for only very nearby objects but if distance increases the angle like keep on decreasing and it's difficult to uh, find the distance of the object so how do we do it in case of stars uh, this you might have covered in the previous lecture but uh, just to like uh, uh, recapitulate so basically if you look uh, uh, any stars uh, from uh, the orbit of the earth at one point and then you uh, look let's say after 6 month back uh, 6 month after it then uh, the position of the stars basically shifts in the sky with respect to the background uh, distance sources okay and that's what you see here so stars basically they move uh, to and fro in the sky uh, with respect to the background target which which are not moving okay and with a simple geometry you can calculate the distance to the star and uh, so the, the, the fundamental unit what astronomers use is basically a uh, parsec and uh, this parsec is nothing but is it's a distance where any distant object make an angle uh, is of about 1 arc second and you know about 1 arc second now because 1 arc second is nothing but uh, 1 by 3600 uh, part of the degree so it's it's something like you can assume that if you're if you take your like uh, uh, thumbnail and this is about a degree so if you like draw 3600 lines over your nails and if you like uh, if you like see the separation of any two lines that is something like a 1 arc second so this is like very very small quantity and if you convert the distance from there then it turned out to be uh, roughly about 10 to 13 kilometer okay so this is like huge distance okay so this uh, this uh, kind of like still a parallax work for very nearby stars uh, or very nearby objects but when the like stars move further and further it's like very difficult to measure this angle okay so how to do that so the alternate way is that uh, now you know that the stars in the galaxies they are not stationary objects they like keep on moving right so if you like uh, look at the stars over a period of time like this will keep on moving it will change its position so this is called the proper motion okay and this is like uh, this is like the changing change of the uh, change change of the angle what the stars make uh, to your eye okay so uh, we have seen like there are lots of stars for example the bernard stars have a very large proper motion it moves roughly about 10 arc second in a period of an year and there is like a nearby star clusters we know this is hydra uh, which has a proper motion of, of about 0.1 arc second per year and the image what you show here is is of the 61 uh, cygni this is a binary stars and 5 arc second per year okay so the given the fact that uh, the uh, proper motion is basically the build up over time so what you have to do essentially is that you have to take uh, the, uh, the images of the sky at two different epochs. Uh, for example, as you compare like these two images, that is uh, shown for a star called the Ballard star, taken in 1950, and you see the star is sitting somewhere here. But if you take it later, the stars has moved from this position to other position. Okay, so this this shift basically, if you know, you can calculate the distance. 
Now, consider a proper motion. Uh, if you consider that uh, proper motion, typical proper motion we see is roughly about 0 0.1 arc second per air. So, to, uh, it, so basically, if, if you take the like sky images over a period of 100 air, so it will only move uh, by, a, by an amount of 10 arc second. And if you compare it with what human eye can distinguish, human eye can uh, discern roughly about an arc minute uh, angular separation, that is 60 arc second. So the point to, uh, I want to make here is that if you want to really want to like note uh, uh, the change in the, in, the, in the, for example, the change in the constellations, this is going to take uh, almost about a millennia or more than that. So you cannot notice it just like that. So if you want to do that, you can use the still in software and like try to see like how it evolves, okay? So, but there are like recent missions, for example, like the Gaia, was, Gaia is there, uh, which has a like incredibly, uh, in, 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 which has basically an incredible angular resolution of about 20 micro arc seconds. And with this resolution, you can basically not only calculate the parallax, but also the proper motion of stars that is down to about the parsec. Okay, so you can find the distance of our object very, very far away, up to 50 kilo parsec. And uh, so this is just to show that, okay, if you know the proper motion, you can get the distance, right? So what about after that? Okay, how do you know, like if there is something after that also? Okay, so we need some alternate for that. And this you have already uh, seen, this is a hudsburg Russell diagram. So for the Milky Way size scales, uh, you know that uh, there's, uh, there's a, uh, so basically the, if you simply use the parallax, the distance you can see up to 50 parsec, uh, that's 1600 light years. And uh, the inverse square law, you know that uh, flux goes as one over R square. And in the uh, HR diagram, if, uh, which is uh, nothing but the uh, luminosity versus color plane. So, and from the spectroscopy, you know various kinds of stars. So you, if you know the type of the star, you can calculate, immediately calculate the luminosity. And given the luminosity and measured flux, you can calculate the distance of the stars or to large scales, okay? So even up to large Mag Magellanic cloud, which is roughly about 100 kiloparsec away to you. Well, uh, you can, go up to there, but now the resolving stars even like get difficult, okay? So there's like even a better distance indicator, uh, which is uh, still like using the variable only that is called the CFID variables. And the CFID variables are actually uh, super giant young stellar uh, star clusters. And you can see them out to about uh, 200 light years. That is roughly about the distance of the LMC, okay? And uh, this has been discovered by Henry Lavitt uh, in early 90s. Uh, who was working on like the variable stars and she could find about 50, 47 such kind of uh, objects. These have like very specific uh, characteristics. For example, if you look, look, if you look at this image, so you can see like you can point out several stars are there which are basically uh, changing their brightness. And if you plot their change in brightness as a function of time, you can see, okay, they have a specific characteristic of light curve. And what Henry Levitt found is that if you plot the luminosity as a function of period, there is a very, very tight correlation between these two. So it means that if you know the period of any kind of this star, you can immediately know the luminosity of this. And then as you know the luminosity, you can calculate the distance, right? So the, so basically the sipids are basically, they're they are very, very bright and you can go out to like 30, 40 megaparsec away from, the, uh, from, from us, like from the sun, uh, earth and sun system. But this kind of uh, technique only work for the spiral galaxies because you know that these are the uh, the these are the systems of vigorous star formation, and so they have the young stars. So basically, you can easily point out the sifts in this uh, galaxy. Okay, but for the ellipticals, it doesn't work because, uh, as you learned in the Professor Mosby's uh, talk, that it, uh, ellipticals are basically basically hosting old stars, so it doesn't work for that. So now given that we have started from a very small distance that is about 10 to minus four light year, you can point out or you can find the distance of the objects out to 10 to seven light year far away, okay? Well, if you want to go beyond that, where even you cannot resolve the stars, now what to do? So we have to go for some alternate stuff, okay? So one can try to use the galaxies as a standard candles. And if you really want to do that, what you have to do is basically you have to find uh, some correlation between the luminosity and some some independent uh, properties of the galaxy okay so specifically like two main correlations uh, ha has, has been found one is called the tully fisher relation uh, that is particularly for the spiral galaxies so what has been found is that uh, as, as you know like uh, the galaxies uh, spiral galaxies rotate and uh, both end up both uh, end of have uh, both end of the galaxy have a different velocity so if you map them in 21 centimeter uh, emission so uh, from the center, you will get emission somewhere here. And from the either side, it will be either blue shifted or red shifted, okay? 
So you basically know the rotation velocity of the galaxy. And if you plot the rotation rate versus the luminosity, it's been found that they again tightly correlates. Okay, so if basically if you know the rotation rate of a galaxy, you can immediately know the luminosity, and again you can calculate the distance. So the point to note here is that the larger the rotation, the more massive it will be, and the more luminous it will be. And how for the elliptical galaxies? For the elliptical galaxies also, it's been found that the galaxy luminosity strongly correlates with the line width of the system. And as you know now uh, that the line width one can easily calculate for the spectrum uh, that is the stellar absorption lines, which is nothing but this level of dispersion in the, in the host. So if you know that, you can calculate the distance of the galaxies, okay? Okay, so this is just to see that we have started from the very uh, nearby distance, that is one parsec, and now we can, sorry. So now we can go out to even, uh, if you use a telepressure relation, you can go out to 10 megaparsec distance, or even like 100 megaparsec distance, which is huge. Now, if you want to like go even further, if you want to map the universe, then you need some alternate stuff. And then people have uh, like started using the supernovae, okay? And we use a specific kind of supernovae that is called type 1A supernovae. And uh, the progenitors, and how do they form? The progenitors of this kind of type 1A supernovae are believed to be uh, binary stars. Uh, and uh, one star basically it evolves, become red giants, uh, then it transfers mass to the secondary one. They, they spend some time in the common envelope, the envelope actually shred away, and then, uh, then one becomes a white dwarf. And the secondary one uh, that aged and become the supergiant, it again transfers the matter to the white dwarf and then it, it cannot sustain and it blasts. So people have detected many supernovae in the galaxy. Here are like three examples to show you that, okay, this is the supernova here and this is one supernova here and one is here. So the point to note here is that you can, so foregrounds are, there are like multiple foreground stars, uh, but comparing like two different epoch images, you can point out the supernovae and you can see that they're bright enough that you can uh, detect them very easily out to like very large distances. So what is the characteristic of the supernovae is that if you compare, sorry, if, if you compare the light curve of the supernovae, that is like different kind of super type one supernovae light curve have been plotted here. You see all of them looks almost similar. They rise, they come to a, a, a plateau and then they fall. Okay. And, uh, but they are like slightly stretched away, right? So if you just correct for the stretching, they come all at the, they are basically having the same shape and you see them all to be at same brightness, okay? So this kind of supernovae have a characteristic luminosity. And if you know that luminosity, you can easily calculate the distance based on the flux. Okay, great. So if you use the supernovae, you can go even further away. So you can go basically up to one gigaparsec distance. So this distance is huge. You will cover like most of galaxies, lots of galaxies, lots of clusters out there. But the, but uh, okay, so th that's great. But the point is that uh, if you want to go even further away, then what to do? Then there is a concept which we have discussed in like previous uh, lots of lectures that is called the redshift. So we'll talk about it. But one milestone of the astronomy we have missed uh, or we have not discussed so far, that has been achieved in 1929 by Hubble. Okay, so this is one of the astronomy in the miles uh, milestone in the astronomy uh, and. Uh, just to tell you like a little bit of history, uh, in the early 19th century, uh, distance was a debate. So we didn't, we didn't knew basically that what is the distance between the Milky Way and Andromeda and, and other, other spiral nebulae. What I'm, why I'm saying spiral nebulae? Because at that time it was even, uh, we didn't know that these kind of like structures we see in the sky, they are, they are actually galaxies or they are spiral nebulae or star forming regions. Okay, so, so, so we don't know like how far they are. So how to know how far they are? Well, uh, before 2019 uh, discovery, in 1912, uh, this gentleman, uh, Slipher at Lowell Observatory, he measured radial velocity of about 25 galaxies. And he found that most of these uh, systems uh, show a redshift, and which is sometimes greater than uh, 2000 kilometers per second, okay? So he knew, he knew that all these galaxies are basically moving away, away, but he has no idea about the distance, like how far these objects are. So he could not make out uh, or he could not like conclude much from his study. But uh, in 1929, Hubble actually was working on the CFID variables. So he was mapping the nearby, this kind of spiral nebulas in the sky. And he, he mapped like several of them, like M31, roughly I think 25 or so. So M31, M33 and other local uh, group galaxies. And here are the, uh, the photographic plates used by the Hubble. So you can see like he has marked lots of CFID variables in the sky. In his, in the sky. And, and uh, just, 
just remember that the CFITs have a specific characteristic. So you, if you know the luminosity of the CFIT, you can calculate the, so, sorry, if you know the period of the CFIT, you can calculate the luminosity and you can get back the distances, okay? And that's what Hubble did. And he not only calculated the distance of those uh, spiral nebulae, but also he took the spectrum as well. So, so for example, uh, this is just, so in the spectrum, you can look for like specific spectral features in the, in the spectrum. For example, if you look at the H and K line, so nearer the object, the H and K line or these absorption lines will fall at the reference position. But as the distance increases, the distance, of the, the, the position of this, these basically specific lines will, sh will get shifted. And so what he plotted here is basically he plotted how far the object is on the X axis and what is the velocity at which you see like the red shifted or the, you can say recession velocity uh, on the Y axis. And to surprise, what he found is basically that it basically strongly correlates, okay? So this tells you that, okay, everything is moving away and further it is, faster it's moving. So here comes the idea of like the systematic expansion of the universe, which has completely changed the face of the modern science. Okay, so yeah, that, that's great. So he, he, he didn't stop there. He basically further tried to map even like even further distances. So these are, uh, this is like from his 1931 uh, paper. And these points are basically showing uh, the data uh, taken in 1929, which strongly correlates. And even you go further, you can see, okay, there, there is a very tight correlation. So the point to note here is that there may be like a systematic expansion of the universe, okay? Well, so he, uh, using this uh, uh, figure, he, he gave a, uh, this equation, which is called the Hubble law now. And it tells you that the velocity and distance correlates with a constant that is called the Hubble constant. And it is a parameter uh, value is about 68 kilometer per second per megaparsec, typically uh, in the present time. And this, uh, the, the point to note here is that H naught is very hard to measure because it's anyway very difficult to find the distances at very large, dis at, at, at if, if the object is very large. But it is relatively e easy to measure the recession velocity, okay, from the spectrum. So the point to uh, note here is that the, just you remember that the more, the more distant the galaxy is, the faster uh, it, it rushes away. Okay. Well, uh, now we can talk about the redshift. Uh, uh, okay, now you know by the what is the redshift. It's been covered in like many uh, lectures before, but I will just uh, give you. Uh, I, will, I will just like tell it briefly one more time. That redshift is nothing but what you are doing is you are measuring uh, the the change in the red, change in the wavelength when it was emitted and when it was observed divided by when it was emitted. Okay, so that's we define as a redshift. And if you are in the like, uh, if you are in the like uh, sub relativistic region, it goes as V over C. And if it's relativistic, it is given by this formula. So the V is nothing but C times of Z. And you can look at it like in other way around also. For example, uh, you can you can say okay, what is the time difference between what the light has been emitted and when when it be when it's been observed? And if you multiply it by you the expansion rate, then you should get the same uh, value that is called the redshift. Okay, this is nothing but the d by c, uh, that, that at the time is d by c divided by the Hubble constant. Okay, so I'm going to tell you that this redshift is basically the cosmological redshift and not the Doppler redshift. But you may ask, okay, why it's not a, uh, why it's a cosmological, why it's not a Doppler, okay? So remember uh, the, the key point from the Professor Das talk, earlier talk, that uh, universe is homogeneous and isotropic and we are not spatial. So basically, no matter from where you see, everything is basically moving away. So this is the one point. And the other point is that uh, you remember what Hubble saw, that uh, farther, the farther the object is, the faster it's rushing away. It means that uh, the galaxies at very far distances have very high velocity. So we cannot understand uh, that why the galaxies are rushing away very fast. So maybe they have some uh, rocket launching uh, thing but uh, that may not be the case. So then the idea comes of the expanding universe. And uh, the point is that it's possible that the, it is nothing but the stretching of the space time. So, uh, and that's what we have just seen in the previous lecture. So the point is that redshift one can use as a surrogate of the distance, okay? So, uh, so, so what we want to know is that we want to know the expansion rate. People have tried very hard to find this, uh, the Hubble constant with various methods, like uh, you can not only use the CFITs, but you can use other indicators also. For example, type one is supernova, you can use Tully-Fisher relation, you can use the relations for the spiral, uh, sorry, uh, relation for the elliptical galaxies. And what you find is that 
more or less, the H0 is quite consistent. And the current uh, widely accepted value of the H0 is roughly about 67.7 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This comes from the European Space Agency mission called Planck. Well, uh, when I say like the universe is expanding, so you may think, okay, if it's expanding, then how it's expanding and what is its nature? So, so Hubble has uh, concluded from the empirical relation from the observations that further it is, faster it's moving. And uh, it is also true that the, this the recession velocity is nothing, that, it's not like that the galaxy is moving through, uh, it, it has a, some motion, it's moving through space. Uh, but uh, the point is that the space time itself is expanding. And this is the like the simplest analogy uh, used many times. So if you assume that, okay, universe is uh, nothing but this balloon, and these galaxies are basically the stickers uh, stick on the balloon. Then if you inflate it, uh, the balloon size increases. And that it means that the distance between the two stickers increases. But the size of the stickers won't increase because basically if you see sticker, they are like uh, tightly bound, right? And if you look at uh, this curve, this is I've shown as basically the wavelength. And you know that the wavelength has an intrinsic size due to which, uh, sorry, this is the light basically. Light has an int intrinsic size because of the wavelength. And if it uh, and if you like inflate it, if the space time extends, then the wave wavelength also stretches. So it becomes basically from if, for example, if here if it's blue shifted, that sorry, if, if it's blue here, it will become red here. Okay. So the point is that on expansion, the distance between galaxies will also grow, but uh, but the stars and the galaxies they will maintain their size because they are gravitationally bound. Okay. So so. So just to like understand redshift in more detail, what is it is basically, uh, if you see, this is the galaxy you want to look at. Uh, if it emits a light, which is having a wavelength of lambda emitted at some stage. And you, uh, so when you receive this light at this point, by the time the space has been expanded by almost say uh, an amount of about twice. So you can say the ratio between uh, the, ch uh, or the change in the wavelength will simply give you the, what is the, uh, by what amount the length has been expanded, okay, uh, which is uh, which is shown by this equation. So this is nothing but a Hubble law. And you may ask, like, uh, okay, if universe is changing, then uh, how can we like uh, think that redshift which is a change in the size? So if you are saying, okay, the universe is expanding, it means that uh, it's just changing the size. And what we are doing is we are just measuring the the length, okay. So you can assume that in the universe, if you if you just simply draw a triangle in the universe. And you assume that, okay, the scale size of the, of the triangle is suppose uh, one, that is in that is a go, like sometimes back when it was young. So I will say it like a then, okay. And suppose now it's been extended, uh, so it's been expanded by some amount, say factor two. So now a now is say basically two, okay. So every side of the triangle will grow with the same uh, amount. And uh, how, we, how we like relate the expansion with the redshift is given by this formula. Uh, which is explained by Professor Das. And sir, I think he said you will also be going to do it in the uh, Sir, if, if I may interrupt. Uh, so, hello? Yes. Uh, so there, has, there is a question here at the chat yes. in the chat box. So do we want to address the questions now or at the end of the session? I think flow is okay. Uh, I can just complete it and then maybe we can all take all the questions later. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Fine. okay. Okay. Sure. So, uh, so you can see like how it relates with the Hubble constant. So, if you just like uh, take any one of the side of the triangle, say one to two, you can simply write the distance of uh, or the or the length of this uh, this triangle, uh, the side of the triangle, uh, can be given as uh, the the length. This is r one two at any given time. You can write it as its previous length time the at what rate it's changing, right? And if you just simply differentiate, you can get the velocity. And uh, this turned out to be the like change in the, basically change in the scale factor times the, its previous length. And if you just substitute this equa these two equations, what you get is something like a dot by a, right? And this equation looks familiar that this is nothing but the Hubble law that the velocity is basically nothing but, uh, it relates with the uh, distance with some constant factor. Uh, okay, and since you know like from the redshift, you know the velocity and so what you're essentially measuring is the change in the scale length of the universe. Well, uh, so if so basically if you calculate the Hubble constant, inverse of it is basically gives you the age. And if you just plug this number 70 kilometer per second per megaparsec, this turned out to be about 14 billion years. Okay, and this has been like many, uh, many uh, 
missions have been uh, launched to understand this uh, the expansion rate of the universe. Like there are like cosmic micro microwave background missions, uh, that's Planck mission, WMAP missions, which gives H naught of uh, roughly 67, 69. And uh, the one value comes from the Sloan and then uh, from the gravitational lensing is 71, okay? So the, the point I want to make here is that uh, we look like basically we are at the center, but uh, that's what every observer will see uh, wherever it is. And if everyone sees the same, it means that the, this is basically the universal property. And uh, given that the universe is isotropic and homogeneity, so uh, I mean, everything in everywhere is same. So now we learned here so far is that the universe is expanding. Uh, and I would like to like show you uh, this movie. This is called The Flight Through Space. Uh, this has been uh, made by Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, this is uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey is basically a spectroscopic and photometric survey, which is mapping uh, the northern sky. Uh, they take basically, uh, they map the sky in different uh, bands, like different wavelengths. Uh, they take the images and they do the spectroscopy also. So they know the distances of the objects, they know the, how do they look like. And this has been shown here. So you can see, okay, no matter like where you see, this looks like almost, uh, almost the same. You can see like lots of galaxies out there. You can also see the clusters of galaxies uh, like moving here and there. Okay, so this is, but the point to note here is that this is not like very far away. This is only up to the redshift of about 0.1. And uh, the next era is going to, is basically going to come that we want to map the universe like even farther away. So there are like lots of uh, ground-based missions like uh, uh, based on the large optical telescope, like for example, six to 10 meter class telescopes, which will, image the universe even farther away doing spectroscopy and uh, spectroscopy and photometry in like multi wavelength not only the optical but the infrared x ray and all the wavelengths okay so uh, so so we we basically we in the next decade we plan to see like the, you know, this kind of uh, things like even deeper in the time okay okay so so now since we have we uh, since like um, the Sloan has mapped the sky out to like a very large depth with uh, the spectroscopic uh, information. So if you look at the 2D image, what it looks like is something uh, like this. So this you have seen, okay, so you can point out like many, uh, there are like lots of structures. You can see the filaments, you can see the voids, in, voids out there. So galaxies basically clusters, uh, uh, clusters and they have like this kind of web, this is called the cosmic web. And uh, the point to not, note here from this, Web is basically this immediately tells you that the gravity is basically the prime mover. Gravity gravity dominates. Okay, so it forms the sheet filaments and eventually like everything drain into the clumps. So they form the galaxy clusters. And remember that in the cluster in, in the galaxy formation, uh, the small structures forms first and then the large st structures forms. And uh, there is a, like another uh, part of the uh, this kind of research is basically uh, trying to simulate these galaxies. And researchers basically try to uh, use like a bunch of known physics and you just see if you can use all this physical law and try to see if you can simulate the universe. And you, you see, okay, this almost look like what we have seen in the, in, in the observations. So that's excellent. So, so far we have seen that universe is basically expanding. And when I say it's expanding, if you look back in time, so it means that the universe was uh, smaller, right? Uh, so everything was together. And if everything was uh, the close by, it means uh, the density was higher, pressure and temperature was also higher. So if you like uh, keep on going back and back in time, it means uh, the temperature will keep on rising. And there will be a stage come where like everything will be like uh, very hot and everything will be in the plasma. And that's what is basically uh, a theory called the Big Bang. And this is nothing but this tells us that our beginning was actually hot. Okay, so uh, and if, if you like believe this, then uh, this Big Bang theory basically predicts three main, uh, it has basically three main predictions, which you can call like three pillars of the Big Bang, which has been confirmed by observations also. And uh, so first of them was the expansion of the universe, which we have already seen and uh, discovered by the Hubble that uh, things are, all things are expanding. And if you calculate like age of the universe from uh, it, this is almost consistent with what we see from the oldest star uh, there. The second uh, prediction is the cosmic microwave background. That is nothing but the relic black body radiation, uh, which it predicts from the early universe. And the third uh, thing is basically the primordial nucleosynthesis. Uh, that if it's like very hot, there must be some nucleosynthesis and you should predict, you should be able to predict some uh, kind of like the, uh, the abundances of different elements out there. Okay, like the lighter elements, basically helium, uh, lithium and uh, barium and boron. 
Well, uh, let's look at the uh, cosmic microwave background first, uh, as you have like already seen, but I'll just uh, quickly go through this. So this is one of the key predictions from the Big Bang Theory, uh, predicted in roughly uh, 1930 to 1940. And as you know, like temperature is increasing, so universe was hotter using black body. And even with the like uh, first law of thermodynamics, if you assume uh, the, uh, the heat exchange is almost zero, so you can write the pressure and the energy term, energy density. And the volume goes as roughly uh, a cube, the scale factor uh, cube. So you can calculate the temperature at, at, at any given time uh, as a function of redshift. Okay, so since it was hot, it was like it should be like it, it, at very high energy. And as the time passes, you should see that today it in somewhere in, in, in the radio wavelength, like in, in roughly around the millimeter. And this is, in fact, has been uh, is actually detected uh, in 1965. So this was like one of the another milestone of astronomy. Uh, so CMB radiation was predicted in 1948 uh, by three gentlemen, like uh, Ralph Elfer, Hammon, and uh, George Gamow in 1948. And they were working on the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, uh, but this uh, prediction was almost forgotten uh, until 1960s. So, but in 1965, uh, Penzian and Wilson, they were mapping the sky in the microwave, uh, microwave uh, radiation using this telescope. And uh, they were also uh, trying to map, uh, they were also like basically testing the, uh, testing the eco-satellite for the communication purpose. So what they noticed that there was like always a constant background noise in their amplifiers. And they were a good researcher, so they just like keep on checking their amplifiers. They could not find like uh, what could be the source of this constant noise. So they like thoroughly checked their antenna and they found it's a, like a, uh, a story that they found like uh, a pigeon nest there. So they just removed it, but still they were getting the same thing. And down the Princeton, uh, people were basically look, uh, looking for this kind of uh, fuzzy noise from the, from the sky. And when they learned this uh, about about uh, learn about like people are looking for this noise. They knew, okay, this is not from our amplifier, but it has uh, something to do with the cosmic origin. Okay, so, but uh, we said, okay, it, uh, we assume that it should be a black body kind of thing uh, because uh, yeah, it, uh, so black, uh, so Big Bang Theory tells us that this, this should be a black body with a characteristic temperature, but how do we know it? So in 1992, uh, there is a mission called Cosmic Background Explorer, Kobe has been launched. And this is the uh, this is the spectrum what Kobe has uh, detected. So you see, okay, it's, it looks like perfect black body. And if you look at the if you look at the error bars here, these error bars are uh, at four sigma level. So you know that uh, usually to uh, to uh, when we say about like how significant the things are, they are basically uh, they are basically we say okay, this this should be basically uh, three sigma should be the significant one. But it, it is uh, very, very precise, roughly about 400 sigma level. And if you look, look at the like, characteristic temperature, this temperature is uh, turned out to be about 2.7 Kelvin, 2.727 plus minus 0.00 K. And, and this is uh, the kind of map uh, Kobe has uh, found for the cosmic background. background. Uh, you see, okay, there are a little bit of fluctuations there, but these fluctuations turn out to be like very, very small. That is only one part in 100 thousands. So, and these fluctuations, uh, one can think of that they are maybe like uh, carrying the imprints of a very early universe at the, at the very early age. Well, uh, then uh, people have tried to launch, uh, people have launched like other satellites also, not only COVID 1992, but the WMAP uh, and Planck were launched in 2013 uh, for the better resolution to map this uh, cosmic macro background. And you can see that this is almost isotropic seen everywhere. And the fluctuations are very, very small. And uh, how, how, do we, how do we get this uh, microwave background basically is uh, just to show you it's uh, one of the uh, movie made by the European Space Agency. And so Planck has like mapped the sky in the cosmic microwave background. And if, if you look at like the, the raw map, it's something look like this. And if you look, Hello? Is it audible to anyone? No. No. This map uh, from your parent image, what? Is 
रवि हेलो हेलो या सो रवि वी आर नॉट ऑडिबल ऑडिबल ओके ओके yeah so this is the map uh, this this is how like we get a cosmic macro background map uh oh okay so now we can we can, we can think of like uh, how does this cosmic macro background originates so as already explained by uh, professor das i'll just quickly go through it again that uh, you know that in the past the universe is like hotter very very hot and if like everything is in plasma the temperature the expected temperature will be roughly around uh, 3000 uh, k and that's what we have seen like in the mdos surface for example so you know that uh, temperature you can calculate uh, given that you know the temperature today uh, uh, then you can calculate that what should be the typical redshift uh, corresponding to the temperature of 3000 k it turned out to be uh, roughly about 1100 and uh, so about the redshift 1100 the temperature was very high everything was ionized and uh, there were electron photons and uh, protons only and electron and proton were like constantly interacting with, e with each other and as the like uh, since you know universe is expanding so the temperature will like quickly cool down and uh, uh, you will you will have like the hydrogen atoms will form and there there will be like no electron left for the photons to interact with so uh, so electrons will uh, so photons will basically now freely move move away uh, and this is like uh, just to show you uh, a movie like how it happens so you have you see like cosmic macro background all around the place and if you like uh, go back in time uh, everything was basically the plasma so what you will see uh, back in time is basically you will see the uh, protons which are red balls you will see electrons green balls they were like bouncing uh, here and there and then you have the photons which are basically keep on uh, colliding with the electrons they cannot move uh, so uh, yeah and when the temperature actually goes down they uh, they recombine and then uh, the photon is like free to move uh, free to move that is uh, and and basically when it moves it passes through like various uh, phase of the universe and it get basically the red shifted it will keep on keep on moving passing through the clusters of galaxies it will like again get red shifted keep on changing colors and uh, basically if in between it uh, it counters any electrons out there then it will basically get deflected uh, and just change its direction move in some other direction and keep on moving uh, keep on like bending uh, from the clusters keep on changing its wavelength and then uh, it it then basically you can detect uh, this kind of radiation uh, with uh, in in the millimeter wavelength using the planck okay so this is this is the way basically uh, this cosmic macro wave background forms Okay, great. So we have gone like I think uh, from uh, from the Earth scale size out to the cosmic macro background, which is roughly about uh, the time when uh, we expect the universe was about uh, roughly three hundred, four hundred thousand uh, million year old. And uh, but 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 the cosmology, uh, uh, Big Bang theory of the cosmology also predict uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So uh, I will. So if so if I I take you like even even further back in time, then. Uh, of course the the temperature is going to like even uh, rise so say if the temperature is like even higher than the million kelvin so it it means something like that you are sitting on the center of uh, a star and if you are there then of course you will have like nuclear uh, fusion reactions there and you will create the uh, light element so since the universe is remember that the since universe is expanding also so you will not have much time to do that but uh, essentially uh, the hydrogen and neutron will uh, couple together they will form the deuterium uh, it will further form like the hel helium uh, he lighter helium and the helium stable nuclei lithium barium and this kind of lighter elements and not not the very heavy elements and uh, so given the like uh, our knowledge of the atomic physics one can basically calculate like what should be the abundance of these uh, elements and uh, which is uh, plotted here in these curves and uh, this this vertical shaded region is because uh, it it comes from the, like uh, the uh, the baryon density typical uh, range what we know uh, it should be something like here and you can see okay can we basically uh, constrain it observationally so okay let's talk about uh, how about the deuterium can we constrain the deuterium so in the yesterday lectures uh, we were told you that uh, deuterium is actually seen in the quasar spectrum so i'll just uh, quickly go through it again uh, so here what is shown here is the quasar and quasar is nothing but they are the quasi stellar object they look like star 
but they are basically uh, the galaxy is hosting supermassive black holes and uh, the center basically outshines the entire host galaxies so what you see is basically a star kind of object and they ha they have like lots of uh, uh, blue emission so basically light uh, when travels from this quasar then uh, when it passes through the diffuse gases structure basically the hydrogen why hydrogen because uh, if you want to look at the deuterium deuterium is basically uh, it doesn't form in the stars so if there is any deuterium uh, form in the nucleosynthesis you should see it in early universe and uh, the uh, these hydrogen clouds are basically pristine so if any deuterium, le deuterium left you should be able to detect it there so when light traveling from this diffuse hydrogen gas it will form several set of absorption lines there and then you can see okay uh, do, can we can we detect the deuterium there and now you know okay deuterium has been seen along with the hydrogen there so you can calculate the abundance of deuterium so yes deuterium is there so nuclear synthesis happened at some stage very early on okay and how about the other element like the helium so for the helium uh, if you look at like population 1 star which are the young star in our galaxy like the sun kind of star uh, in the in this kind of star 70% we see like 70% of it is hydrogen 28% helium and 2% of it is metal okay and uh, in the population one stars, uh, you can say, okay, the helium may, might have come from population population two stars, which is like slightly older stars. And if you look at the like population two stars, uh, the, it's, the composition is you get like 75% of hydrogen, 25% of helium, and very, very less amount of the metal than 0.01% metal, okay? So the question is that why did the helium in population two star? And I mean, where, where does this helium comes in the population two stars? And if it comes from the, like even early phase of the stars, then where are the metals? So metals are not there. Okay. So then it tells us that it might have a cosmic origin. So uh, so helium has a cosmic origin, which again this metal abundance uh, supports the Big Bang nucleosynthesis model. So if you put like the observations here, uh, just comparing the predictions with the observations. So the predictions say that helium should be 20 to 26 percent, uh, but uh, but you, if you look at the observationally, this is found to be roughly about 20 to 25 percent, which matches uh, quite well. And if you look at like uh, the deuterium, then deuterium is roughly about uh, the predicted is predict, predicted value is roughly 10 to minus 4 to uh, 0.1 percent, but observed is uh, 0 0.001 to 0 0.02 percent. So this put like even tighter constraint to the deuterium as well th than the predicted value. Okay, so the point is. Okay, the point is that my big bang, big bang might have happened. So this is like the one of the uh, well-discussed theory, which which basically predicts many things, and observations proves proves it. So what we have seen so far is that we have started from uh, very nearby galaxies, and then we could see down back to like three hundred thousand uh, light years back, cosmic uh, micro background, and even further away we could see we could uh, speculate. Okay, or we could even confirm that uh, some nucleosynthesis might have happened. And this is just to show you that if uh, if you ask like how far we can detect like in, uh, from from the from the telescopes in optical, so Hubble has like so far detected a very very uh, distant galaxy roughly at redshift of about eleven, which is seven hundred million years after the Big Bang. Okay, so it means that the galaxies have formed galaxies have formed quite early in the in, in the in the age. Okay, so 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 many success, but. Uh, there are like even further sub surprises out there. So if you look at like the, the composition of the universe, now by now you know, okay, there is only 5% of uh, the normal matter uh, by which stars, uh, you and me, and everything is being made of. But uh, roughly 95% of uh, matter is, we don't know what it is. So this we uh, say like, either it's a dark matter or it's a dark energy. And how, how do we uh, know that? So for the dark matter, uh, this has already been discussed by Professor Das. Now you know that if you plot the like uh, rotation, uh, rotation uh, velocity uh, or rotation curve of a galaxy, then the actual curves appear something like this, but the predicted one is something like this. It means that there is some extra amount of matter which we don't understand well. Okay, so this one can think of maybe the maybe the gravity is different at different large scales. But uh, we accommodate uh, it with the uh, uh, unknown matter, which is called the dark matter. And this, there are like other observational evidences also. For example, uh, people have seen the gravitational lensing in clusters. So because of the high mass, uh, the light bend, and you see like the multiple uh, images of the background sources. So it tells us that, okay, 
there is some extra amount of the matter which we don't know. So probably it's a dark matter. This may be a dark matter, or maybe we don't understand gravity very well. So you can ask, like, what dark matter is actually? So okay, you say okay, I don't believe on, I don't believe in dark matter. Maybe uh, there are like several black holes out there. Uh, uh, so I will say okay, if black hole would have been there, then uh, you, we would have detected it in the form of supernova remnant. So this is not the possibility. You may say okay, how about the normal stars, which are very dim? If so, we would have detected it with the HST, Hubble Space Telescope. And how about the dwarf and planets out there distributed? But if we would have detected uh, them in the gravitational lensing, and how about the rock and dust? If so, then we should have certainly detected them in the in, in, with the infrared satellite. Okay, so these possibilities are not there. So dark matter, in, in like uh, in a sense, it's a new kind of matter, which we know interact with the gravity, but it doesn't interact with the matter and the photons. And it is like much heavier, uh, roughly six or seven times that of the baryonic matter. Okay, so so there is not only dark matter, but there are like further more surprises. Okay, so what has been uh, done here recently is basic, basically people have looked for like how this uh, universe expands just by mapping the supernovae out to very large distances. So this is like you can make the like uh, uh, the diagram something like Hubble made. And what you see here is these, all the points are measurement from the supernovae. And uh, this all points basically are found to be uh, higher than the, than the than what is predicted, what is, what is basically you should expect from the local observer. So all the supernovae were found to be slightly fainter uh, than what they should be. So if, like, if they are found to be fainter, it means that uh, distance what you're calculating is actually, is act, uh, distance what you're calculating is basically less okay so this tends to be slightly essentially slightly more and if it should, should be more then it means that the universe should have accelerated uh, at some stage okay and that's that is like one of the uh, possibility so then we know okay there's something there which is called the dark energy uh, which is causing the acceleration of the universe and for this uh, this has been uh, got a Nobel Prize uh, in 2011 uh, and these three gentlemen got the Nobel Prize. Well, so what is the status of dark matter versus dark energy? So we have learned that the dark matter and dark energy are both unknown quantities. And we, can, we don't know what they are, but we can infer their presence uh, by the various cosmological observations. Uh, dark matter, we know, okay, it is uh, it almost like a normal matter because it gravitates, but it doesn't interact with the radiation, uh, neither the variance and neither the photons. And uh, dark matter, uh, and, you may ask like how to find it. So maybe the expected, uh, we can expect to de detect at some stage in the laboratory as a signature of physics beyond the standard model, or maybe it's in some astro astrophysical event. So it is like yet to be discovered. And the dark energy, uh, it is still unclear. Maybe it's a, some hint of a new physics. Okay. So, okay, this is just to summarize. Uh, so for the cosmology in the near future, uh, basically we have still to address what is this dark matter is. And what is the nature of dark energy? Uh, for the expansion rate of the universe, uh, we can map the supernovae uh, distances, but we want to like even map it further. Like uh, red supernova goes out to redshift of about one or so uh, with the current facilities. But uh, if you really want to map like redshift two, three, uh, uh, you might know like redshift two and three are basically the epoch where, which is the epoch of uh, largest, where, the, where, where basically a lot of star formation and uh, happened. So how the like ex expansion of the universe happened at that time, okay? So we want to map it with like even further distances. Uh, and uh, then uh, we still don't know like the, the, this kind of questions like uh, how the first galaxies and supernovae would have been formed and whether the physical law uh, are the same at large, that large distances. Of course, like combining our understanding of all the physics and detailed simulations uh, uh, along with the many proposed observations will help us to understand like uh, how the universe is actually look like uh, or, or evolve. Well, so I will just uh, just finish uh, here with this, uh, this thing that the universe seems too big to summarize and more we explore more uh, mystery appears basically. So one should try. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll just take questions now. Uh, here I can see about uh, two questions. One is from YouTube. Uh, Kevil Chetri is asking, 
is there any symmetry in expansion do space time manifold expand spherically okay so i think expansion is basically uh, expansion is, should basically symmetric okay no matter where you see it should be like same for all the observers or all the, all the uh, observers so universe is basically expanding symmetrically uh, yeah and if if it's manifold then this is like something like uh, asking about the multiverse right so this is this is this is possible okay because because this is not the only theory like uh, we should believe like we should keep on exploring aparna is asking is our universe expanding with a constant acceleration how far or how long will the expansion continue like will the expansion stop eventually or it just goes on okay this is actually a tough question because uh, we have to basically uh, wait but uh, universe is expanding uh, universe is basically accelerating and uh, if it like keep on accelerating basically then uh, what will happen is that the things will move up, uh, move apart and then then this basically lead to the dark age uh, that's what the uh, professor das has uh, shown in his last section that the things will move move apart and you will like it will be very difficult to point out whether uh, any galaxy out there or not okay uh, adya datta from youtube is asking the fact that the hubble rate is considered to be almost constant does it tell us something like the distance distance between two galaxies are so large that their mutual interaction is negligible i mean the linear dependence of velocity and distance from us seems like a very idealistic case okay so so basically universe is not constantly expanding so basically h is a function of time so this is basically the acceleration will uh, so expansion will like keep on changing it's not a constant number so what we measure is what is the expansion rate now okay so then uh, uh, the uh, from gopal chetty the question is why is only the isotopic model considered apart from anisotropic and can you also brief about ccc which provides insight of the big bang uh may i interrupt aratrika yes sir i think we have enough time to allow the participants to the people who are asking question to speak okay 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 that will be more interactive let's do that mm -hmm. so gopal chetty can you please uh, uh, say the question directly unmute yourself please sure ma'am thank you so much sir for the wonderful session uh, like i have two questions uh, my first question is uh why only the isotropic and uh, homogeneous model of the universe which is called the big bang cosmological model is considered because uh, there are some anisotropic models as well which were proposed but uh, due to some observational limitations they were not considered hello i i can't hear you uh, hello So were you able to hear my question? Your voice is breaking probably I don't know if my internet it's slow or it's like your slow. So it's clear to I us. think I think it's your connection okay. bro. Okay it's my connection. I I heard like a part of the question. He said like uh, why the homogeneous model is being considered. So, so okay, and he repeat. actually answered Okay sure. Can you repeat the question? What's his name? I forgot. Uh, sir, my question is: uh, Why only the homogeneous and isotropic model of the universe, uh, which is preferably known as the Big Bang cosmological model, is considered? Uh, because there are several anisotropic models also as well, which uh, which which are in tune with the observational evidences. Oh, I'm sorry. I cannot hear. Actually, internet is slow. Okay, Ravi, uh, but, I. Uh, but... Go on, please. Oh. So should I paste it in the chat box so you can see it from there? 
Yeah, sure, that will be great. Please. Sir, I have forwarded you the message. Okay. Uh, Okay, the question is why is only the isotropic model is considered apart from the anisotropic? And uh, can you also briefly uh, brief about the CCC which provides insight of the Big Bang? Okay, uh, the point here is that why isotropic uh, model has been considered? Uh, okay, you, you, so we have like number of models uh, and it has like, uh, the theory has like several predictions. So if you really want to rely on a model, it has to be tested observationally. Okay, so the Big Bang uh, theory of the isotopic model is the one which uh, basically uh, uh, which basically uh, predicts uh, several things, and those has been confirmed. Whereas the other model, like steady state uh, universe or uh, what you said, like an isotopic one, they they don't give the real picture or what they predict is not been uh, is not been confirmed observationally. So that's why this is the, like the well discussed or most discussed model, uh, the Big Bang theory. Uh, so and the second one is the, the, the conformal cyclic cosmology is basically universe interacts. Uh, we know that uh, it's possible that universe interacts through uh, the infinity cycles. Uh, yeah, but it's like, I think it's difficult for me to answer this. Probably if uh, Professor Das uh, can answer, that will be great. Can say something about it. Which, what, which one? The isotropic one or the, what is the 3C? Uh, yeah, what is, yeah, th that is the 3C. What is this 3C stands for? Can you uh, tell whoever has wrote the question? Th that is that. Uh, uh, okay, so that actually, is, the 3C uh, is formal cyclic cosmology. Hmm? Can't hear. That is, uh, this is this is basically so stands for conformal, uh, conformal cyclic, cyclic cosmology, cosmology that universe interacts. Through. When both of you are speaking, I'm not able to hear. Uh, one person maybe can speak. When universe interacts with, I, okay, I, so this is conformal cyclic cosmology. Okay, conformal. universe interacts to infinity cycle basically. Okay, so there is a model by uh, uh, from Princeton group that uh, it's a uh, is called a quadratic universe. It goes expand and contract, but there is a problem. There are two major problems. Uh, it's it there is something called uh, spectral tilt of inflation. So. It's called blue tilt. It is not totally ruled out, but uh, mostly people don't believe it because of some. It has some prediction which does not go in favor of CMB. Uh, it's called. It's a little bit detailed of perturbation, cosmological perturbation, and spectral in tilt. So that's why people are not. Uh, but still, some people does work on that. It's revised Paul Steinhardt group in Princeton. But it's observationally not favored that much. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Kartik Tiwari, can you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Kartik Tiwari? Um, yeah, I had a similar question on anisotropy, but I guess it was already discussed quite a lot. So, yeah, we can move on to the next question. Okay. So there's this question from YouTube. Hemish Delwadia is asking, is fifth or sixth dimension universe exist? Okay. Yeah. Okay, fifth or sixth dimension. Uh, I think, uh, oh, this is a difficult question. I think as string theory says it, uh, but I'm not sure. Observationally, it's, it's not there, I think. Uh, Professor Das, uh, would you like to say something on this? Uh, fifth yeah, it's the same what you said. Uh, it's a theoretical prediction, uh, but hidden dimensions are there, uh, smaller dimension in string theory, but we have not got any 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 observational evidence for that yet. So it's still a theory. It's not an not an acceptable model of universe yet. The next the next question is also from YouTube. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Kable Chetri is asking if universe is accelerating, why don't we feel the acceleration? Why don't we feel the acceleration of the universe? Yes, yes, that's what he's uh, Kevin Chitri is asking. 
Okay, but okay, that is like interesting question, but uh, I have not thought about it. But of course, like uh, where we are is basically uh, we are uh, we we feel the gravity of the earth. Like this is basically uh, the gravitational force doesn't work on very large uh, distances. Oh, so, sorry, sorry. Uh, so so we are basically in the earth. So we we mostly feel what we feel is basically the earth gravity. But I think the amount of the the, the acceleration what the universe is expanding that is uh, it's like way beyond what we can feel probably. Also, I can add here, uh, uh, Ravi. Yeah, please. One thing, yeah, that the yes, actual, to feel the velocity of Hubble expansion, you, the distance between two objects has to be very high because the the Hubble constant is very low. So you cannot say that I want to measure the expansion rate between Sun and Earth. That will be uh, very tiny. So in the same way, to find the acceleration of the universe, you, the distance between two objects. Because you need a relative object, no? Where you want to measure its velocity, that has to be like what Ravi said uh, that it has to be uh, in supernova distance far away, in a higher rate, light year, much billion, like million or even billion light year, basically. Then you feel it. Uh, so it is like on up, on top of a balloon. Balloon is expanding very slowly. So two ants who are very close, they will never feel that balloon is expanding or even accelerating. But if you go further away, then you can see that it is going away because it's proportional to the distance. Yeah. The next question is from Akash Kumar. Akash Kumar, can you please unmute yourself? Hello, am I audible? Yes. Uh, my question is that uh, how we know the exact proportion of the dark matter and the dark energy, like 25%, 70%, how we know that? Okay, so dark matter and dark energy, basically we know from the, the precisely we know from the CMB measurements. So if you have like the, uh, if you basically map the sky in CMB, you have like uniform, uh, you have like isotopic distribution, but you can, you can make the power spectrum. So you can, you can ask like uh, how the like density, uh, how, how the density vary between the two points or at, at what angular scale it maximizes, okay? So basically, then if you look for this uh, this uh, uh, this power spectrum, we get basically the multiple peaks, and uh, the the first key peak basically the the the, the size of the peak gives you the uh, the content of the baryon because it highly depend on the, the the height of the first peak highly depend on the content of the baryon, and the second two peak basically is the the second two peak basically uh, reflect the dark matter content. So I think. Uh, this is one of the way to calculate it. The next question uh, is Professor from... Das, would you like to add something? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you told it's from CMB only and the matter power spectra, we can measure the dark matter and as well as dark energy also. Uh, it, it fits, there is a fitting from CMB data, six parameters of the universe get fit, uh, base fit value and that tells us. And also locally we can measure the dark matter density by weak lensing, and by galaxy survey, SDSS, as you said, matter box spectrum. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sribala PS, can you please unmute yourself? Good afternoon, sir. So I was having a doubt that Hubble constant have different variation estimates over time. So is there any particular limit that we can predict up to which Hubble constant can vary in its value? I think this has to be uh, tested observationally only. Uh, yeah, because they, because there is no other way. Uh, so you like uh, keep on like uh, finding the, the standard candles out to very high redshift, and this is like a a, a, a question of like it, uh, the, the ongoing research that people are trying to find like various kind of standard candles. For example, as I said, like supernova, people have uh, trying to use up to redshift one because it's very hard to detect it. But at even higher shift, people are now trying to uh, to find new candles. Like for example, the quasars. Can we use quasars as a standard candles to know the kind of uh, the H naught value? Yeah. So this is like uh, still people are trying to find to, to find it. Okay. Uh, Kartik Tiari has another question. Can you please ask it? Yeah. Um. I wanted to know how has the acceptance between cosmologists of 
non mainstream theories like mon changed over time like um, are there more people convinced of mon or is still the majority of people in the opinion that dark energy and dark matter explain everything okay so uh, i think for mon uh, what i remember is that it doesn't produce uh, the, the the galaxy clustering very well professor dark could you please answer this i mean can you say something on this the status of the mon yeah so as you said exactly that is that mon can explain the data in our galaxy rotation curve and that does perfectly fine but dark matter is not only observed from galaxy rotation galaxy scale it has been observed from cluster scale as well from cmb so it has and when you apply mont you cannot produce the 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 galaxy cluster dark matter distribution as well as uh, the cmb during cmb also dark matter needs to be there because in mont there is no dark matter you modify the newton's law to match the galaxy rotation curve but what we find from observation that dark matter needs to be there even in the beginning of the universe so that's it so that's why mont is kind of not uh, accepted in the community okay so uh, this the question from vinayak style was asked in the previous session so, so maybe you can ask it again uh, like uh, himself vinayak sanil can you please unmute yourself yeah uh, good afternoon am i audible yes okay uh, sir uh, i want to ask when you were speaking about uh, a grand unified theory uh, like can we treat gravity as an emergent force rather than gravity being a fundamental force like if we consider that uh, all elementary particles have their own masses so uh, just the uh, three basic forces strong weak and electromagnetism can cause these fundamental particles to come together form atoms and molecules these atoms and molecules can later form complex uh, bodies which will have uh, celestial masses uh, which can later warp space time so rather than gravity being a standalone force if can can we treat gravity as a force emerging from a, a cumulative working of the all the other forces yeah nice question but the thing is uh the gravity works even when there is no other particles so it has to do with the space time because if you uh, want to create universe or inflation uh then it has to emerge from nothing uh as the work by stephen hawking and other people then you need gravity there because it's the gravity which basically determines the shape of space time emerging so and then the matter came later the matter the matter is produced from inflation after that so it's the other way around i think but of course some people has tried so i don't know that much so i think gravity is most fundamental and then the other forces can evolve so if i can add to that yeah prabha yeah. yeah so this this question is in the regime of quantum gravity so this is a active area of research actually there are several attempts by various people to treat gravity as emerging by considering space time as you to there are many ideas floating around so you can think of space time what we see is space time continuum as emerging from some uh, discrete sort of mathematical object mathematical i, I use the word mathematical because it's hard to uh, to visualize or express what it is so from that kind of a discrete object the average properties of that kind of a space emerging as a force as as gravity that we know classical gravity uh, there are many attempts uh, and in, in, in that kind of uh, research by people who work on quantum gravity so the major difficulty is in combining quantum part and the gravity part the usual you know um gravity that we understand which has no quantum mechanics in it to combine this two so this is very very active area of research and uh, it is uh, there is no no final theory yet uh, thank you ma'am thank you Okay. The next question is from YouTube. Hari Priya Hari Kumar is asking, how do observations of the microwave background support the importance of dark matter in galaxy formation?
Okay, so CME basically tells us, uh, if you look at like the CMB, there are like very, very tiny fluctuations out there, okay, and which we believe that it's been originated very early on. And uh, this is basically uh, the, the formation of the, uh, this is basically, we believe that it causes the cluster, of, uh, uh, basically clustering of the galaxy, is an isotropy. And uh, this basically eventually grow because of the gravity over a period of time. Yeah. Okay, there are two more questions from YouTube. Hamish Delvadia is asking, uh, is big crunch theory valid or invalid in cosmology? I think it's not about valid or invalid. Uh, we can have like n number of theories, uh, but the point is that we have to test them observationally. Otherwise, uh, I mean, there is no point, right? So we prefer Big Bang because uh, it, it, uh, we can prove, prove it observationally many times. Oh, sorry, with, 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 with many, many evidences. Uh, yeah, I think that is the only I can say because there are many alternate theories uh, to the Big Bang, but uh, we only prefer the, the Big Bang theory. Sir, Big Crunch is not a theory. It's part of the uh, the big theory which is describing the universe using Einstein's equations. So it's a prediction, one of the predictions that can happen in the future. So it is, uh, you know, the question of whether it is valid or invalid is the question is not well posed. Okay, please move on. Okay, the next yeah. question is from uh, uh, GN Deka. Uh, what is failing the expansion of the universe? What is filling the expansion of the universe? Failing, failing. What? Uh, could you please repeat the question again? Uh, uh, what is fueling the expansion of the universe? Like, what is driving it? What is driving the expansion of the universe? Okay. So, okay. So, so as as we just saw that uh, the most of the the, uh, the content of the universe is basically the dark energy, and we believe that this is basically a kind of negative pressure, which is basically a keep uh, because of it the universe like keep on expanding. So yeah, so basically dark energy is the, is the main driver now. That's what the Professor Das has also uh, shown us, right? Uh, at this epoch, the dark energy should dominate. Okay. So Prasad Rathu, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, my question was, how does the dark matter interact with space-time fabric? And what are the gravitational effects we observe due to it on matter? Like, what are the uh, things which are reflected on matter due to the presence of uh, dark matter in the uh, co cosmos? Okay, so this, I think this we have discussed multiple times. Dark matter uh, is basically, uh, it's a matter, we don't know the composition, but it gravitates. And if it gravitates, it allows like, uh, for the structure formation, okay. So this is one of the key for the structure formation. So uh, yeah, so this, this, this yeah, so basically it gravitates. And things will uh, come uh, along it, and then it will form this uh, the, the structures in the universe. I think I missed your second part of the question. Uh, probably. Uh, Prasad, can you please repeat the second part of your question? Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. What are the gravitational effects yeah, that you, you, uh, are, yeah, you ask about what, what, what is the gravitational effect? So, huh. yeah, yeah, I, I, I remember that, sorry. So the observational effect would be is that, so dark matter, you can basically, uh, you can infer it uh, observationally only. So that's what we have seen. Like you have, yesterday you would have done this, uh, this exercise calculating the, the dynamical mass of the galaxy, or you can uh, look like the lensing uh, events you can look like where the light has been bent because of the very high mass con concentration. And not only this, but uh, you can look uh, like the peculiar velocity of the, of the galaxies in the clusters. They move very, very fast uh, with a velocity of even like thousand kilometers per second. So with this velocity, they should have like uh, moved from the cluster, right? So, but they are there. So why they are there? Because they're like extra amount of the matter. So, so dark matter is there. We can basically infer observationally, uh, but how it's, it be, so it doesn't interact with the photons or like uh, the normal matter, basically. Okay, thank you, sir. 
Kushar Agarwal, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, yes, am I audible, ma'am? Yes. Uh, yes, my question is that how could we explain the distortion of space time by other fundamental forces uh, like electromagnetic force? Okay, so basically gravity dominates on the large scales and electromagnetic force are basically uh, this, uh, on, on the very small scales, right? So, yeah, so basically gra gravity dominates on, on the large scales, uh, not, not these, these, these kind of forces, not the other forces. But I can add uh, one thing, Ravi, that it's the electromagnetic Please. properties of photon only that travels through the gravitational bending, uh, space-time bending. So that's why the proof of GR actually came from looking at the light, light trajectory around the sun because the space gets distorted. So you will see that, that whole thing because of the photon's trajectory. That itself is an electromagnetic wave. So when electromagnetic wave passes through the curved space-time, it bends and that's what Ravi also showed in weak lensing and all these things. So that's where we measure. Okay, any other questions? Risha, are there any other questions from YouTube? Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, no, sorry. I don't see any on YouTube. Uh, one, guy, one guy has uh, raised his hand. Can you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, I'm audible. Yes. Uh, so, um, sir, the yes. recent survey of uh, dark energy survey, or the recent publication, they have uh, released 30 research papers and they said that the W parameters is uh, somewhat uh, equal to minus one and the cosmic shear value is also uh, lesser than uh, what they had calculated uh, uh, means before five years ago. So that uh, sir, uh, it uh, really says that uh, there will be some modification in GTR, general uh, the relativity. Hello. I think I have not looked into it. Professor Das, could you like say something on this? Uh, okay, I can tell. So uh, the dark energy survey result is consistent with G GTR and it is consistent with cosmological constant till now. So the cosmological constant of what I discussed, W equals to minus one. So yeah. we don't need any more, more any model of beyond GTR yet. Okay, there's a question from Rishabh. He's asking, Rishabh is, means our uh, co-host Rishabh. Eventually, what is the fate of a galaxy as a unit in a far, far future? Yeah, so this is as it is asked for me, I'm answering. Uh, so as uh, Ravi also said that intergalactic distance will be so far that we cannot see the light from other galaxy. Now I know you understand what will happen to our galaxy. There, it depends on the model. If you are at W equals to minus one, the kind of rate of expansion you get, acceleration, we will stay pretty much like an isolated object for almost uh, next 50 or 100 billion years. So by that time, uh, I think other thing may, catastrophe may happen. But if W is not minus one, there is a recent paper, uh, Prova was also mentioning it is one of the prediction. If, it is not cosmological constant. If it is more violent acceleration, then you can show that the galaxy will also start disrupt. The stars will fly away and it will be such an exponential acceleration that finally even molecules can disrupt also. So again, you will end up in empty, empty space. So, but this is still a speculation, but there has been a model on that. Uh, it's, it's a catastrophic future of the universe, even for our galaxy. Yes. Okay, if there are no further questions, shall we wrap this session and meet again in the, in the next, after, after lunch break? Yeah, so. Uh, Rishab, you have, you have, Rishab? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you wanted to announce the feedback form, no? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Please do.
let me share the link first i think that will be so can i request people to not type in the chat box for the moment so rishab has shared a google doc on the chat box please take a look at it so this is the feedback form so you are requested to fill it after the end of the last session today yeah you can save this link for later and maybe in couple of days you can share it i mean submit it so we'll get the feedback from you so i have posted the link i hope you will got it Uh, even we can make it in the web page itself, so, so that yeah, 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 yeah. That okay, glad it. I think we can wrap now. Uh, one problem with putting it on the web page may be that people who have not participated. and fill it okay okay uh, once again then we can share in the afternoon session yeah yeah we'll we'll share it again so i think we will not put it on the web page yeah. okay so we have a break for lunch okay i'm closing and i'll open by 2:00 then okay <laughs>